Thank you for joining us and welcome to this virtual board meeting of the National Transportation Safety Board. I'm Robert Sumwalt and I'm honored to serve as the chairman of the NTSB. And joining me today are my colleagues on the board, Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg, Member Jennifer Homedy, Member Michael Graham, and Member Tom Chapman. Today we meet in open session as required by the government and the Sunshine Act to consider the fire aboard the small passenger vessel Conception off Santa Cruz Island, 21 miles south southwest of Santa Barbara, California on September the 2nd of last year. The Labor Day fire began in the early morning as five crew members slept in their bunks on the upper deck. Two decks below, 33 passengers and one crew member slept in the bunk room. A crew member on the upper deck, awakened by a noise, noticed a glow from the aft main deck and alerted the remaining four crew members that there was a fire on board. And at 3.14 a.m., the captain radioed a short distress message to the U.S. Coast Guard before evacuating the smoke-filled wheelhouse. Crew members tried to get to the bunk room through the main, main deck salon, but were blocked by smoke and fire. Unable to reach the bunk room, they jumped over belt board. Two of them reboarded the vessel at its stern, but once again were blocked by smoke and fire. Ultimately, the five crew members who had been sleeping in the upper deck survived, and two were treated for injuries. But tragically, tragically, the 33, crew, the 33 passengers and the one crew member who had been asleep in the deck, in the bunk, below the deck in the bunk, bunk room, lost their lives in a fire. And on behalf of all of my colleagues on the board and the entire NTSB, we want to offer our sincerest condolences to the family and friends for those who have been lost in this tragedy. Please understand that the reason that we are meeting and the whole reason for the NTSB safety investigations is to learn from this accident to prevent similar tragedies in the future. Today we will discuss passenger vessels and the regulations under which small passenger vessels such as Conception operate. The draft report includes information about a number of accidents involving small passenger vessels, both large and small. We will touch on these earlier accidents because in these earlier investigations, the NTSB made recommendations that we hoped would prevent the next tragedy. But in some cases, those earlier recommendations were never acted upon, and that in itself is a tragedy. Each board member has studied the draft report and each of us have individually met with the investigative staff. But today's board meeting is the first time that we, as a deliberative body, will have gathered to discuss the report. Today, the staff will lay out the pertinent facts and analysis found in the draft report. They will present draft findings, a probable cause, and recommendations to the board. And then we on the board will question the staff to ensure that the report as we adopt it today, truly provides the best opportunity to enhance safety. Staff will present safety issues, including the lack of small passenger vessel regulations requiring interconnected smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces, the lack of a roving patrol, small passenger vessel construction regulations for means of escape, and ineffective company oversight. The public docket for this report contains almost 1,700 pages of additional relevant material, and it's available on our website at ntsb.gov. The report that we will approve today will also be available on our website in a few weeks once any amendments voted upon today are incorporated and the report is formatted for release. At this time, I'd like for each of my colleagues on the board to introduce themselves. Vice Chairman Bruce Landsberg. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's good to see you. Member Hamadi. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. And Member Graham. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Vice Chairman, and uh, fellow board members, and to the investigative and staff. I look forward to our deliberations today. Good to see you, Mike. Member Chapman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, and my thanks to all of our team who did such a great job on this investigation. Thank you. It's good to see each of you. I'll now ask our Managing Director, Sharon Bryson, to introduce introduce the investigative and support staff who will be participating in today's board meeting. Hello, Ms. Bryson. Hello. Thank you, Chairman Sumwalt. I'd like to also thank everyone who helped make this virtual board meeting happen today. It is always a team effort involving multiple staff members representing a range of offices here at the NTSB. In this virtual environment, my only administrative announcement this morning is a reminder for the meeting participants to silence their electronic devices um, at this time. Now I would like to introduce the staff for today's meeting. Mr. Adam Tucker is our investigator in charge. Mr. Joseph Paniotto is the fire and explosions group chairman. Marcel Muse is survival factors group chairman. Andrew Eilers is the operations group chairman. Carrie Bell is the human performance group chairman. Bart Barnum is the engineering group chairman, and Kristen Jeselnik is the report writer editor. Mr. Morgan Terrell is the acting director in our Office of Marine Safety. Liam LaRue is the chief of investigations for the Office of Marine Safety. Rob Jones, the deputy chief of investigations for the Office of Marine Safety. Mr. Jim Sheffer is the program management officer for OMS. Kathleen Silba is our general counsel. Catherine Catania is our deputy director for the Office of Safety Recommendations and Communications. Mr. Jim Ritter is the director of our Office of Research and Engineering. Scott Rainey is the safety recommendations specialist in the area of marine. And Dr. Mary Pat McKay is our chief medical officer. The presentation We'll begin with an investigation overview by the investigator in charge, Adam Tucker. Adam. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Sumwalt, Vice Chairman Landsberg, and board members. I would like to provide an overview of the events that took place on September 2nd, 2019. After being notified of this accident, Member Homendy and NTSB staff arrived on scene the following day. Investigators and staff from these offices assisted with the on-scene investigation and the development of the draft report. I would like to acknowledge the staff noted here for their support during the investigation and report development. I would also like to acknowledge the staff noted here who produced this virtual board meeting. Parties to this investigation are listed here and we would like to thank them for their participation throughout this investigation. The 75 foot conception was delivered in 1981. The vessel was purpose built to take recreational divers on day and overnight trips to dive sites around the Channel Islands National Park, located off the coast of its home port of Santa Barbara, California. The conception was constructed of fiberglass laid over plywood and had three decks, the upper deck, the main deck and below deck. The conception was certificated as a small passenger vessel and could operate with a capacity of 99 passengers or 46 during overnight voyages. The vessel was inspected by the U.S. Coast Guard under 46 CFR Subchapter T, which contains regulations for small passenger vessels. Vessels constructed before 1996, known as existing vessels, are required to comply with portions of the current regulations. Coast Guard inspectors use the term new T to reference the current regulations and old T when referencing pre-1996 regulations. Because of the build date, 
the conception was an existing vessels in the regulations. The conception was operated by Truth Aquatics Incorporated. Truth Aquatics had two remaining vessels in their fleet, the Truth and the Vision. The Vision was similar in size and layout to the conception, and as such, the below deck bunkum arrangement, safety systems, exits, and means of escape were examined by NTSB investigators. The upper deck of the conception consisted of the wheelhouse, which had two crew bunks. After the wheelhouse were two crew staterooms. Five of the six crew members were sleeping in these areas at the time of the accident. Further aft was an open sun deck. On the starboard aft of the sun deck were stairs that led down to the main deck, which were the sole means of passage between both decks. The main deck of the conception consisted of an enclosed salon, which had tables, chairs, food service counters, and benches. At the forward part of the salon was the galley, which consisted of electrical cooking and refrigeration equipment. Forward on the starboard side were two stairways that led down to the below deck bunk room and shower room. Highlighted in yellow, at the aft of the salon underneath the food service counter was an escape hatch from the bunk room below. The main entrance to the salon was through foldable doors. These doors were always kept open when there were passengers on board and provided access to the main deck aft. On the main deck, there were hatches to the below deck engine room and lazarette. The below deck of the conception consisted of the following spaces, each segregated by wooden watertight bulkheads, the anchor room and the shower room. The bunk room, which contained 33 bunks, was arranged around two aisles with bunks on each side of the aisles. There were 13 double bunks and 20 single bunks. One crew member was assigned a bunk in the bunk room. The escape hatch, shown here in yellow, was located on the center line above the aftermost set of bunks. An overhead smoke detector was located in each aisle of the bunk room. After the bunk room was the engine room and the lazarette. The conception was on a three-day dive trip to locations around the Channel Islands, California, over the 2019 Labor Day weekend. The voyage began Saturday, August 31st, and the conception was scheduled to return to Santa Barbara on Monday, September 2nd. There were a total of 39 people on board, consisting of 33 passengers and six crew. The accident took place while the vessel was at anchor in Platts Harbor about 3 a.m. local time on September 2nd, 2019. Platts Harbor, marked here by a red triangle, is located on the north side of Santa Cruz Island, about 21.5 nautical miles from Santa Barbara. Weather conditions at the time were reported to be favorable, with little to no winds and smooth sea conditions. On the evening of September 1st, after completing a night dive, all passengers and crew went to sleep. About 1.30 a.m. on September 2nd, a crew member woke up and did some work in the main deck galley. Before returning to his bunk, he noticed the time as being 2.35 a.m. Sometime after 3 a.m., the same crew member heard a noise from below. He got up, exited his stateroom, looked aft, and saw a yellow glow emanating from below the sun deck. That crew member alerted the other crew that there was a fire on board. The crew found the salon to be engulfed in flames. At 3.14 a.m., the captain of the Conception made a day call. Crew members attempted to open the forward galley window, but were unable to do so. 
Access to the port and starboard fire hose stations were blocked by the fire. Crew members prepared and launched the skiff. The skiff was driven to a nearby anchored vessel, the Great Escape. After waking up the two occupants at 3.29 a.m., a distress call was made from the Great Escape to the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard was informed the Conception was fully engulfed in fire to the main deck. The photo on the right was taken from the nearby vessel and shows the Conception on fire. The Coast Guard launched response assets, including rescue boats and helicopters. At 4.27 a.m., the first Coast Guard response boat arrived on scene. At 4.55, firefighting efforts commenced from the harbor patrol boats. At 6.45, after water reached the burned out main engine exhaust, the conception sank. None of the 34 occupants of the bunk room survived. The conception sank in about 61 feet of water, about 21, 20 yards from the shoreline in an inverted position. The following day, recovery divers from police and federal agencies began recovery of victims and debris from the seafloor and the hull. Ten days after the conception sank, the vessel's hull and debris were recovered and transported by barge to Naval Base Ventura County for examination. Safety issues that were identified in the fire on the conception were lack of regulations for smoke detection in accommodation spaces on small passenger vessels. Construction requirements for means of escape, lack of a roving patrol, and ineffective company oversight. Staff believes that weather and sea condition were not factors in the accident and the use of alcohol or other drugs by the conception deck crew likely was not a factor in the accident. This concludes my presentation. The Fire and Explosives Group Chairman from the Office of Research and Engineering, Joseph Paniyotu, will now discuss fire-related findings. Good afternoon, Chairman Sumwalt and members of the board. In this presentation, I will discuss the fire damage to the conception and the determination of the probable area of origin and likely ignition sources. I will also discuss the smoke detection system on the conception and its role in the accident. The fire aboard the conception burned out of control for approximately one hour and 40 minutes without intervention. After the arrival of the first responders, the suppression of the fire took an additional 13 minutes before the fire was extinguished. Finally, the conception sank and became inverted on the seabed. Due to the combustible nature of the conception's fiberglass over plywood construction, very little of the main deck and upper deck remained. After the wreckage was recovered from the seabed, it was staged at Naval Base Ventura County. The ATF and the FBI, with the assistance of the Coast Guard, worked to reconstruct as much of the wreckage as could be identified by laying it out in three sections representing each deck. Items and portions of structure that could be identified were placed in their corresponding places in each of the three sections. The NTSB examined the wreckage on September 25th and spent two days at the site. The examination of the wreckage did not reveal evidence that indicated a probable origin area or a cause for the fire. Since no physical evidence was left that could lead to the determination of the origin area and cause of the fire, the investigation relied on the interviews of the surviving crew members and their description of the fire at the time they discovered it. In addition to the crew interviews, an examination of a similar vessel in the Truth Aquatics fleet, the Vision, was performed to identify the types of ignition sources in the areas described by the crew as being on fire. 
Furthermore, statements from previous passengers about the typical operating practices aboard the Conception and a previous incident aboard the Vision were also taken into consideration. After becoming aware of the fire and while still on the upper deck, the crew members described smoke rising along the periphery of the sun deck. When one of them went to the aft part of the deck to use the stairs, he observed fire at the bottom of the stairs blocking his path. The first crew member to get to the main deck lowered himself down from the forwardmost part of the sun deck on the port side. He then went down the port side walkway and arrived at the salon entrance where he observed fire filling the main entranceway to the salon. He described the fire filling the interior of the salon and molten fiberglass dripping from the ceiling. He also noted that the area of the escape hatch was on fire. Realizing there was nothing he could do from the main entranceway, he headed to the bow of the vessel. The other crew members, after jumping down to the main deck from the port side wing station, observed smoke and flames emanating from the port side salon windows. This blocked their path to the aft part of the vessel. The crew member descriptions of the fire at the time they discovered it consistently identified the aft portion of the salon compartment as being the center of the fire's involvement. The crew member actions and the description of the circumstances exclude all the other areas of the vessel, such as the upper deck, the galley, the engine room, the lazarette, the anchor room, and the shower room. It is also unlikely that the fire originated in the below deck bunk room, since it was a small compartment occupied with 34 persons and monitored by two smoke detector units. Therefore, staff believes that the likely area of origin was the aft portion of the salon compartment. A survey of potential ignition sources in the vicinity of the fire origin was conducted. Ignition sources capable of initiating accidental fires can include malfunctioning components of electrical systems. Components of electrical systems, such as wiring connections and receptacles, can degrade over time, creating points of high resistance, which in turn can cause localized heating and ignition of materials in their proximity. Although the electrical system in the salon of the conception could not be examined, pre-accident photographs of the conception and the examination of the vision revealed electrical systems in the aft portion of the salon. The interviews of the crew members and the statements from previous passengers indicated that it was a common practice to recharge battery powered devices overnight in the salon compartment. The area within the salon where this would take place was the aft portion of the salon. The devices and chargers were typically placed on the aftmost tables on both the port and starboard sides. Devices and chargers would also be placed over the port and starboard side seat backs on the aft bulkhead of the salon, as shown in the photo on the top right of the slide. The charging of batteries is known to be a risk that can lead to accidental fires when a malfunction of either the charger or the battery occurs, causing the battery to go into thermal runaway. On a previous voyage of the vision, this in fact occurred, but due to the presence of passengers in the salon, the fire was immediately discovered and extinguished. Another possible ignition source would be the improper disposal of smoking materials. Although not inside the salon, but directly outside and underneath the stair leading to the upper deck, there was a combustible type of waste container shown in the lower photo on the slide. Smoking materials improperly disposed of inside this container could have also posed a potential ignition source. The crew statements were not indicative of any known smokers aboard the vessel, except for the captain who would smoke on the wing station on the upper deck. Since no physical evidence to identify a particular ignition source was found, the cause of the fire remains unknown and the potential sources would include those just discussed. The statement from a crew member indicated that he was the last person in the salon and galley compartment of the conception as he was preparing and cleaning up for the next day. He stated that before he went to the upper deck where he slept, he had looked at the clock on the wall and the time was 2.35 a.m. At some point after that, he was awakened from his sleep by noises from below. 
That is when he got up from his bunk and observed a glow aft of the sun deck. It is estimated that this was approximately 30 minutes after he was last in the salon. Based on the overall statements from the crew members, the fire was already very large at that time and had begun spreading from the salon area. Fire growth depends on the ignition source, the first materials to become involved, their orientation, and the space within which the fire is growing. Since some of these elements are unknown, the exact time of the ignition within the 30-minute period cannot be determined. The conception was equipped with smoke detectors in the passenger bunk room as required by the applicable regulations. Due to buoyancy, hot products of combustion, including smoke, accumulate mostly at ceiling level, forming a smoke layer which gradually thickens and extends downward towards the deck as the fire progresses. In this accident, for the smoke to reach the detectors in the bunk room, one deck below the salon, a significant time would elapse, allowing the fire to keep growing undetected. By the time sufficient smoke could reach the detectors in the passenger bunk room, the fire would have grown and made the salon compartment impassable. In 1996, new regulations for T-boats came into effect. Neither the pre-1996 or current regulations require smoke detectors in the salon or other accommodation spaces. Early detection of a fire is critical to occupant survivability. Had there been smoke detectors in all the accommodation spaces, then the fire would have been detected at an early stage. This would have allowed the passenger evacuation to begin before the fire would have blocked their escape. Staff has proposed a recommendation in this area. This completes my presentation. At this time, the Survival Factors Group Chairman, Marcel Muse, will make his presentation. Good afternoon, Chairman Sumwalt and board members. My presentation will cover the survival factors aspect of this accident. These elements include the means of escape, small passenger vessel regulations, egress effectiveness, and the Coast Guard and Municipal Emergency Response. The conception had two means of escape from the bunk room, both of which led to the salon. The primary access was a spiral staircase in the starboard forward corner of the bunk room. Anyone trying to escape the bunk room with a fire in the salon would have encountered heavy smoke in the stairway and low visibility conditions. Had they succeeded in ascending the stairs, the main door to the deck and the windows would have been blocked by the fire and heavy smoke. The secondary emergency exit was a square escape hatch aft on the center line in the overhead. The escape hatch was accessible from both the port and starboard aisles by climbing into one of the top aftermost inboard bunks. This emergency exit opened into the aft part of the salon where the fire was most intense. Surviving crew members reported seeing the whole area around the escape hatch ablaze before abandonment, indicating it was not an option for escaping the bunk room. Staff believes the concession bunk room's emergency escape arrangements were inadequate because both means of escape led through the same space, which was obstructed by a well-developed fire. The conception was designed to meet the regulations in place at the time of construction in 1981. As such, the vessel was required to have not less than two escape avenues from the bunk room. There were no additional requirements regarding size, egress times, vertical access, or obstructions. Regulations for new vessels built since 1996, which did not apply to the concession, require, among other things, an escape path to be a minimum of 32 inches wide. They also require escapes of a number and dimension sufficient for rapid evacuation. The rapid evacuation is not further discussed or defined. Although both old and new regulations require vessels to have two exits from an occupied space, spaced as far apart as practical, the regulations do not preclude having both exits lead to the same compartment, as was the case on the conception. If the escape hatch had exited to a space other than the salon, optimally directly to the weather deck, the passengers and crew member in the bunk room may have been able to escape. Staff believes subchapter T regulations are not adequate because they allow for primary and secondary means of escape to exit into the same space, 
which could result in both those paths being blocked by a single hazard. Staff has made a recommendation to address this. Even if the bunk room escape had not been blocked by fire, there still may have been difficulties evacuating a large number of people through the hatch in a timely manner. The escape path through the hatch was not easily accessed because of the bunks below it. Passengers would have had to climb up a ladder onto the top bunk, crawl to the center line, stand, and then pull themselves up through the hatch. The configuration would have been challenging for anyone to navigate without practice. It would have been further complicated by low lighting and poor visibility. Further, it would have been extremely difficult to evacuate an injured or unconscious person through the hatch. The older regulations did not stipulate the size of escapes, egress times, or vertical access, or address the possibility of obstructions. Therefore, staff believes that although designed in accordance with the applicable regulations at the time, the effectiveness of the conception's bunk room escape hatch as a means of escape was diminished by the location of the bunks immediately under the hatch. Staff has made a recommendation in this area. Investigators reviewed the reports completed by the coroner's office, all of which attributed smoke inhalation as the cause of the deaths. The bunk room ventilation likely continued to operate during the initial stages of the fire, giving that there was a fire in the space above the burning area, a ventilation imbalance, and that there was only one open exit, it's likely the bunk room filled with smoke. Corner reports and diver video also documented that some of the passengers were wearing footwear, indicating occupants were awake and attempting to escape prior to being overcome by smoke. Those passengers who were awake would have likely awakened the other passengers before they attempted to escape the bunk room. Staff believes that most of the victims were awake but could not escape the bunk room before all were overcome by smoke inhalation. The fire was already well developed when the captain made his distress call. The Coast Guard responded with helicopters, a patrol boat, and two small boats, one of which ferried fire department, advanced life support personnel, and equipment. The first boats covered the 27 nautical mile distance at night in about 50 minutes and found the conception completely engulfed in fire. They searched for survivors in the water and along the shore and treated the injured crew members aboard the Drake Escape. The first search and rescue helicopter arrived about the same time. Municipal fireboats and a commercial salver followed and had the fire knocked down 13 minutes after their arrival. Staff believes the emergency response by the Coast Guard and the municipal responders to the accident was appropriate, but was unable to prevent the loss of life given the rapid growth of the fire at the time of detection and the location of the conception. This concludes my presentation. The operations group chairman, Andrew Ellers, We'll now discuss operational matters. Good afternoon, Chairman Simwalt and members of the board. In my presentation, I will discuss the operations elements of this accident. These elements include the following, the lack of a required roving patrol, the lack of verification of this requirement, and the need for safety management systems for small passenger vessels. Small passenger vessels are required to have a suitable number of watchmen to guard against and give alarm in case of a fire, man overboard, or other dangerous situation. The watch is required to patrol throughout the vessel at night, whether or not the vessel is underway. On the conception and all other subchapter T vessels visited by the NTSB during the investigation, the requirement for a roving watch was underscored in the vessel's certificates of inspection which stated that a roving patrol should be designated at all times when passengers were in their bunks. Former captains of the Conception and other Truth Aquatics vessels, as well as owners and operators of other dive vessels in Southern California, all stated that they were familiar with this requirement. According to survivors of the accident, all members of the Conception crew had gone to sleep the night before the fire. No roving patrol was assigned. When the crew awoke, the fire was well developed and beyond their capability to extinguish it. The crew was not able to warn passengers or aid in their escape. Had a crew member been awake and patrolling the 75 foot long conception on the morning of the fire, it is likely that he or she would have discovered the fire at an early stage, allowing time to fight the fire and give warning to passengers and crew to evacuate. 
Staff believes that the absence of the required roving patrol on the conception delayed detection and allowed for the growth of the fire, precluded firefighting and evacuation efforts, and directly led to the high number of fatalities in the accident. The Truth Aquatics vessel's conception, vision, and truth were inspected no less than annually by the U.S. Coast Guard to ensure compliance with applicable regulations. In the five years prior to the accident, only minor discrepancies were found during inspections of these vessels. At the same time, however, each of the company's vessels was operating without complying with the requirement for the roving patrol. When asked by investigators, Coast Guard inspectors stated that they could not verify compliance with the roving patrol requirement because inspections were not conducted during overnight voyages or with passengers embarked. There is no requirement for a log for the roving patrol and thus no records exist to verify that a roving patrol is being properly implemented. Coast Guard inspection aids and checklists do not include line items to verify or discuss regulatory watch standing requirements or the terms of the certificates of inspection. Coast Guard records show that since 1991, no owner, operator, or charterer has been issued a citation or been fined for failure to post a roving patrol. Therefore, staff believes that the Coast Guard does not have an effective means of verifying compliance with the roving patrol requirement for small passenger vessels. Staff has proposed a recommendation to address this issue. When properly implemented, an effective tool for safety oversight is the safety management system, which is a comprehensive documented system to enhance safety for a company and its vessels. Regardless of the size of a company, an SMS defines the roles and responsibilities of all personnel, ensures standardized and unambiguous procedures for each crew member during both routine operations and emergency situations, and establishes safe safeguards against identified risks. An SMS requires procedures for reporting accidents and identifying and correcting nonconformities. Finally, the SMS includes an audit process for management to ensure policies and procedures are being followed. U.S. flag vessels engaged in ocean-going international service are required by regulation to have an SMS but there is no SMS requirement for the domestic passenger vessel fleet. Thus, Truth Aquatics was not required to have an SMS for its vessels. The company did have a loss control program, which is an insurance industry-based program designed to manage risk and reduce losses. Truth Aquatics loss control program shared some elements in common with an SMS, including emergency procedures and accident reporting requirements. However, the program did not have procedures for normal vessel operations, and there was no requirement to develop policies or procedures to prevent future occurrences of accidents. Further, while the program had procedures for identifying and correcting nonconformities, it did not have an audit process for company management. Staff believes that had an SMS been implemented, Truth Aquatics could have identified unsafe practices and fire risks on the conception and taken corrective action before the accident occurred. Staff has proposed a recommendation to address this issue. Furthermore, staff believes that implementing SMS on all domestic passenger vessels would enhance operators' ability to achieve a higher standard of safety. Staff has proposed a reiteration of a currently open recommendation to address this issue. This completes my presentation. The next presentation will be from the Human Factors Group Chairman, Carrie Bell. Good afternoon. In my presentation today, I will discuss the human performance elements of this accident. These elements include the following. The Truth Aquatics training in critical areas, complacency, and lack of company oversight. Regulations required that new crew members be instructed on the duties that they would be expected to perform during emergencies. The captain was responsible for ensuring that the crew members were trained in their assigned duties. The conception had a posted station bill that contained a list of each crew member's assigned duties, 
including instructions in case of emergencies. The newest crew member on board had no understanding of a station bill, and according to interviews, three crew members had not been involved in a fire drill since they'd been working on board. Of those three, one had been working on the vessel for two years, one for about a year, and the other for only two months. Some former crew members also stated that they had not participated in fire drills while on the vessel. Another safety critical element is the passenger safety briefing. This is required to include location of emergency exits in a demonstration of life jacket donning instructions. On the conception, it was common on overnight trips for no crew to be on board until after hours, until hours after the passengers arrived. A welcome aboard card was available to passengers in the salon and placards with life jacket donning instructions available in each bunk. However, in-person safety briefings with crew members were not completed until the next morning after the passengers had slept on board and had transited and anchored at the first dive location. Though Truth Aquatics had a good reputation in the industry, staff found many examples where the company and crew showed signs of complacency, a pattern in which formerly safe behaviors begin to vary, eventually including deviations that increase the risk of an accident. Each crew member was responsible for following the policies and procedures in the employee handbook. From crew interviews, it was clear that the company was not verifying that the newest crew members understood or even read the policies and procedures of the company before getting underway. One crew member stated he, that he received the new employee documents just prior to the accident voyage, which was his fifth or sixth voyage on the vessel. No documentation of training or drills was found in the company's personnel files, and in 2017, the Coast Guard had issued a deficiency related to the vessel's drill log not being up to date. Regulation required that the vessel always be under the control of a credentialed mariner. The captain and the second captain both were credentialed mariners, and when the captain needed a relief, the second captain took the helm. However, it was discovered during interviews that deckhands had also been assigned helm watches at night while when other crew members and both captains were asleep. In addition, as Mr. Ellers described in his presentation, roving patrols were required according to the vessel COI, but were not carried out. These patterns of complacency often, and in this case, lead to what is called normalization of deviance. Normalization of deviance occurs when people within an organization become so desensitized to non-standard or deviant practices that they no longer feel that what they're doing is wrong. This desensitization typically occurs over time and only when all the critical factors line up, disaster occurs. The vision captain said he believed that having one crew member sleep in the bunk room somehow fulfilled the roving patrol requirement. He said he assumed it must be fine since the boat had been operating successfully this way for so long. Regardless of, a, of being a reputable operator in the dive boat industry, staff found several unsafe practices on the company's vessels, and it was clear that the crew had been deviating from required safe practices for some time. There were no company-wide operating procedures or crew work rest policies. The captains of the Truth Aquatics vessels were given broad authority over the operations of their vessels to include the hiring, training, and dismissal of crew members the conduct of routine maintenance, and the establishment and enforcement of vessel operating procedures. The lack of a top-down commitment by the owner to be involved in the execution of his own company expectations exhibits a poor overall safety culture. Instead of being involved, he relied on his captains to ensure that the crew was adhering to the intended policies. Although an SMS was not required, certain functions of the SMS, for example, the auditing process would have provided an avenue for combating normalization of deviance by identifying and addressing the safety issues within the company. Given the culmination of safety issues found, staff believes that Truth Aquatics safety oversight of its vessels operations was inadequate. Mr. Chairman, this completes the staff's presentations. I wanna thank staff for those very good presentations, as well as 
a good investigation considering all the challenges that you've had. So we will now turn to the board member questions and uh, board members will have, uh, we'll do rounds, five minutes per board member. We'll do several rounds and vice chairman, you're first. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the staff for a uh, very thorough report. So what we have here is a fire that goes undetected because of an unenforceable regulation to have a roving night watchman to back up an inadequate smoke alarm system. On top of that, we have a very difficult or perhaps almost impossible to use emergency escape system that exits to nearly the same area as the primary exit. What could possibly go wrong? As Ms. Bell has just stated, uh, Truth Aquatics had a good safety record and was highly regarded uh, in the industry and in the community and by the Coast Guard as a solid company, unlike many others that we've seen in some of our investigations. And I think she properly stated um, there was a lack of, com or there was complacency and I would also say a lack of imagination uh, that surprised both Truth Aquatics and the Coast Guard. No one anticipated that this tragedy could happen in the way that it did. And sadly, we've learned otherwise. Um, she spoke at some length about the normalization of deviance. And I would say that in many cases, this is where people are relying on luck as opposed to good procedure. So I do have a question on um, escape requirements, and this may be a little difficult to answer, but on airliners, the aircraft certification requirements state that all occupants must be able to exit within 90 seconds with half the exits blocked. And you, notice, uh, you noted in the egress uh, regulations, uh, part 177, that on old T vessels, such as the Conception 2, uh, or conception, there were two avenues of escape. Uh, they could be adjacent to each other. So has has that changed uh, in the new T regulations? Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, our survival factors group chairman, Marcel Muse, would be uh, best able to answer that. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman, there was uh, that part of the regulation didn't change uh, a whole lot between old T and new T. Both require uh, two means of egress from a space of, of that size, and both have to be separated as far as part of, apart as possible uh, to avoid something like this happening. Uh, what's not mentioned, though, is the exit discharge, which in this case went to both spaces. That's not discussed in either the old or the new T uh, regulations. Okay. Um, I, I think it said also, how does the Coast Guard interpret uh, number and size sufficient for rapid evacuation? Sufficient for rapid evacuation is the verbiage in the, in the new regulations, and we were unable to find any guidance that uh, specifically defines that or discusses it. Um, it's left to the either the local OCMI or on the larger vessels, the Marine Safety Center would, would determine if that's uh, what's appropriate for that. Mm. How long would it take for 34 people to uh, exit a sleeping area through an escape hatch if the primary exit were blocked? Just, do you have any idea? Well, Vice Chairman, this, the small passenger vessel fleet is comes in a much uh, a huge variety of shapes and sizes and services. Uh, and, and clients, so it would be hard to tell exactly uh, from both the boat or from fleet to fleet and you know, what that time might be. And I think this is um, something that uh, not during today's meeting, but at some point we should discuss with the Coast Guard what changes might be made and some logical recommendations uh, relative to escape times in this tragedy, because it's all well and good to have two exits, but if people, if they're not sufficient for people to get out and there's no determination as to what's appropriate, except in the mind of the beholder or the operator, um, we can get some pretty uh, broad uh, evaluation of that, if you will. And I think after this uh, tragedy, we really uh, ought to be able to do better. Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, defer the rest of my questions for the next round. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and Member Homedy. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the staff for an excellent uh, presentation and for all your good work on this investigation. You had a lot of challenges, uh, which I will go into uh, with a lot of questions today. Uh, for now, I want to start with Mr. Tucker and Mr. Panayotu, if you could put your cameras on. It's so much easier to talk to somebody rather than a, a you know, um, uh, a blank screen at, at times. Um, Mr. Paniotu, uh, can you also bring up uh, Mr. Tucker, page 31 of the presentation while I'm talking, while I'm asking my first question? Um, although we couldn't positively identify the actual ignition source, would, would the outcome have been any different for each of the ignition sources, source possibilities which are listed here, electrical systems, charging batteries and devices, and properly discarded smoking materials? Uh, Member Hamadi, no, I do not believe that the outcome would have been any different. Uh, the circumstances that allowed the accidental fire to go undetected really did not rely on what actually started the fire. Um, any fire, regardless of the cause, if it goes undetected, um, will result in the same situation, especially if it happens to be in an area that blocks the escape path. Well, and I think that that's a key here. I think a lot of people will, some people may walk away and say, well, I, I, I wish I knew what the ignition source was, but the key here is that the focus should be on that conditions were present that allowed the fire to go undetected and to grow to a point where it prevented an evacuation. Those are the safety issues that we need to be focused on um, because these uh, ignition scenarios that could have occurred with any of those and there'll be fires in the future. So um, would you agree with that? Yes, I would. The, the focus should be on how do we detect these fires and prevent them, not so much what started the fire because there will always be accidental fires. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, true. Uh, Mr. Tucker and, and uh, Mr. Paniotu, I'm going to have more questions, so don't, don't, don't go away. Mr. Tucker, in a statement to the Coast Guard, the first Gallyhan said he remembered plugging in his cell phone at night and seeing sparks. Is there any more detail to this? Uh, thank you, Member Hammondy. Um No, there's not any additional detail. Unfortunately, we were not able to uh, interview the, uh, the first Gallyhan that had uh, provided that in a statement to the Coast Guard. Why? Uh, while we were on scene, uh, we were able to interview three of the surviving crew members. However, after that, uh, uh, once the uh, intent to pursue criminal in, uh, criminal investigation uh, to this matter, uh, NTSB investigators were prevented from interviewing uh, both the first galley hand and the master of the vessel. And I, I have a lot of questions on that as we go through here, and I'll circle back to that. But um, sure. I do want to go back to the charging issue real quick. Uh, in reading the interviews, there were, can you describe, Mr. Paniotu, what was stated uh, by, by those we were able to interview on what these charging stations look like? How many devices, I know they said sometimes People, during questioning, there might be some on two sides, the port side and the starboard side, and maybe talk about what that looked like. Um, as, as far as I understand from the crew member statements and from statements from previous passengers, it was a common practice to recharge the flashlights and the cameras and all the different devices that the passengers and crew would use on the aftmost tables and over the seat backs on the aft bulkhead area. Um, so th that was pretty typical. What exactly was plugged in on the night? We don't know exactly because it was a normal practice and the crew members didn't take stock each time as to what was plugged in and exactly where. And uh, some reported, actually, there were two separate reports where they may have seen 15, 20 different devices plugged in in these areas, correct? That is correct. And uh, on the vision, and I, I'm almost out of time, I'm going to circle back and ask more questions on this, but um, on the vision, there was an incident 
uh, involving a lithium battery. And um, it was reported to the owner per one of the witness statements, correct? And did was there any indication that the owner then reported to the rest of the crews of the other vessels for Truth Aquatics? Uh, I think maybe Adam has more detail on that. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, it was stated uh, that it was reported to the owner. However, the owner um, uh, informed us that this was not reported to him. Uh, the owner had uh, trip documentation that required any type of uh, abnormal conditions, uh, events that took place during the trip. Uh, it was a spot to fill in um, in that form and uh, there was nothing, there were no entries in there. We were able to verify that there were no entries. Okay, great, thank you. Member Hamidi, thank you very much. And Member Graham. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I wanna thank the team for the uh, great job at the investigation and the report. I'd like to thank uh, Member Hamidi for the great lead in because I wanna talk about uh that uh other fire on the other uh the other boat that truth aquatics owned um you identifying that one of the most likely ignition sources for the conception fire was the unattended batteries being charged and prior to conception fire there was a fire aboard the truth aquatics boat the vision in october 2018 what was the cause of that fire uh member graham i can answer that um that fire on the on the on the vision on 2018 was caused by a lithium ion battery uh, that was in a charger left unattended overnight. Okay, thank you. So, 11 months prior to this tragedy aboard the Conception, Truth Aquatics had a boat in their fleet set ablaze by unattended batteries being charged. Luckily, two of the passengers caught it and they quickly extinguished the fire. According to the captain of the vision, I believe he was a relief captain at that time, who did he notify of that fire again? Uh, I believe he said he notified uh, the other captains uh, for that particular fire. It was a small fire uh, that was extinguished by two passengers. Okay, so, and I believe he said he actually notified the Truth Aquatics owner at the time too, is that yes. correct? Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So, he notified two people of it. Uh, that of the battery, uh, unattended battery charging fire. Um, I'm looking into the documents here and actually uh, I see that Truth Aquatics actually has a, what they call a loss control program. And uh, in there, there's a form called this safety inspection form. Now I know you just said that the owner said that that should have been reported, I believe on the, on the bottom of a trip sheet. It looked more like a, uh, a reimbursement form that uh, with that is what they turn in afterwards to be reimbursed for any expenses and to know how much fuel they burned and all on the trip. But this safety inspection form was there to identify and rect rectify problems of the type that a hazard like a fire. And I'm looking at this here. Um, was there one of these forms completed or filled out for that fire? We found no evidence of any form being completed for that. Okay. Yeah, it's unfortunate because it talks about hazards and it talks about what they did to rectify the problem, remedial procedures and what they do to mitigate it. So um, are we aware of any remedial uh, procedures that were that mitigated this or were done after that fire to take care of that hazard? We are not aware of any remedial procedures, no. Okay, so Truth Aquatics actually had a, a, a document that is, we even say in the report, is kind of a building block to a, a safety management system. However, this loss control program is ineffective if you don't live by it, you don't mitigate it, you don't use it. It's, it's uh, if you put a document on a shelf uh, and don't use it, it's, uh, it becomes worthless. So instead of them assessing that fire problem and analyzing it and controlling it, and then um, mitigating that prod, uh, that, uh, that hazard, uh, they they failed to follow their own procedures in this whole process, which is unfortunate because maybe that would have helped prevent this uh, tragedy. So with that, I'll go ahead and um, uh, yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Member Graham, thank you very much. And Member Chapman. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As the investigation reveals, there were clear and frankly heartbreaking opportunities to break the chain of circumstances which culminated in this catastrophe. <clears throat> Perhaps most important, why were there no roving patrols on board the Conception? It's my understanding the requirement to keep a watch at night on passenger vessels has been codified in U.S. law for nearly 150 years. The requirement appears in statutory law, it's interpreted through Coast Guard regulation, and it's incorporated into the Certificate of Inspection for vessels such as the Conception. Yet the Conception and other true aquatics vessels were regularly operating in violation of the requirement that there must be roving patrols at night and while passengers were in their bunks. Has Coast Guard established a clear conceptual framework to help operators, particularly operators of smaller vessels, ensure they are complying with the roving patrol requirement? Member Chapman, uh, no, they have not. And since the accident, what actions has Coast Guard taken, if any, to ensure operators are reminded of and comply with the requirement to keep a watch at night? Uh, Member Chapman, uh, our operations group chairman, Andrew Ellers, would be best able to answer that. And Member Chapman, as far as we know, um, there has been no effort to enforce this requirement. When we talked to investigators, excuse me, inspectors from the Coast Guard, um, they felt that they really didn't have a mechanism to be able to verify the requirement. So uh, staff has proposed a recommendation along these lines. And certainly I understand the challenges for Coast Guard in terms of enforcing this, especially since, um, you know, it, 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 it could conceivably involve inspections at nighttime, which is unwieldy, impractical. Um, but obviously we see here that the failure to comply has, has potentially tragic implications. How might an appropriate roving patrol be conducted on a vessel of the size and configuration of a, of a vessel such as uh, Conception? Well, the, most vessels that uh, are within subchapter T regulations are, are relatively small. So a, a single person who uh, conducts regular um, patrols throughout the vessel going to each space uh, would be enough to um, fulfill the purpose, which is, of course, to guard against and give alarm in case of fire or other emergency. So this wouldn't have to be something elaborate. This is this is a really relatively simple uh, requirement to fulfill. Yes, it is. And am I correct that Truth Aquatics regular practice was for passengers to board vessels the night before an early morning departure uh, w with no other crew members on board? That is correct. Uh, Per their website and per what we talked with uh, previous passengers, uh, passengers were encouraged to board the night before a very early morning departure. Uh, they would often leave at four or five in the morning. Um, and from when we talked to crew members of other vessels in the fleet, also um, former passengers, the crew was not required to show up until um, just before getting underway. So. I believe the draft indicates that crew members weren't required to be aboard until 30 minutes prior to uh, to getting underway. And that's even though the passengers had boarded the night before and had been on board for several hours and presumably had been asleep for much of that time, correct? That is correct. So an obvious violation of the requirement to maintain roving watch. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll hold the rest of my questions for the next round. Member Chapman, thank you very much. Uh, captain Ellers, uh, you were a uh, captain on board a U.S. Navy destroyer, and you spent a uh, career in the Navy on, at sea. And would you agree that a fire on board a vessel would be extremely something that would be very potentially hazardous? Absolutely. On a vessel with a fire, there's nowhere to go, so the fire must be fought. Absolutely. And would you agree that key to fighting the fire or dealing with it would be early detection? Yes, sir. And, um, of course, the early detection method in this case would be the roving patrol. And it's already been established that the, the, the certificate of inspection for this vessel required the roving patrol. 
This is the COI right here. It's a very simple document. It's like it's not like 300 pages of, of boilerplate. And right here on the permitted conditions of operation, there are only three things. One, the the, the waterways that the vessel can operate in, uh, how many crew members need to be on it, and then finally, the part about the roving patrol. A member of the vessel's crew shall be designated by the master as a roving patrol at all times, whether or not the vessel is underway when passenger bunks are occupied. And clearly, they did not comply with this. As my colleagues have pointed out, uh, uh, crew members or passengers could board uh, and sleep on the boat before crew members were even there. And we also know that a roving patrol was not established during the voyage itself. Now, I did note that, um, and it was also noted in the staff presentations, that uh, a previous vision captain, so vision, of course, being a sister ship to Conception, felt that having crew members sleeping in a bunk room, quote unquote, somehow fulfilled the requirements for a roving patrol. His notion was that having a crew member sleeping in the bunk room somehow fulfilled the requirements for a roving p patrol. Uh, you know, maybe that person would be sleepwalking. I'm, I'm not sure how that anybody could even possibly believe that that would fulfill the requirement. You know, just for fun of it, I looked it up in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And the definition of roving means that not restricted as to a location of concern, capable of being shifted from one place to, the, to another, and mobile. And for patrol, the actions of transversing a, a district or beat, of going on the rounds uh, for the observation of maintenance or of security. And so I don't, that's just uncognizable that somebody could think that having someone sleep in the bunk room would constitute a roving patrol. We know that uh, a former Truth Aquatics captain told the LA Times, and I quote, it's a regulation, but it wasn't really followed, end quote. The owner of the Great, uh, great um, Grape Escape, which was, of course, the vessel that the five crew members ultimately uh, um, went over to, when, when we interviewed, when investigators interviewed him, he said, and I quote, here's my question. I go into a hotel, 3.30 in the morning, I guarantee there's somebody at the front desk. And as he referred to the conception, he says, you're a floating hotel why the hell wasn't somebody awake? And his question is a very good question. We've seen repeated evidence of violations with this company. According to the COI, we've established that it's not legal to have passengers on board without crew members roving. Uh, is it legal? Is it legal? to delay conducting a safety briefing until the vessel has been underway for four hours. Is that legal? Mr. Chairman, the regulations state as soon as practicable, um, as or prior to getting underway or as soon as practicable. Uh, staff believes that the delay that happened, the four hour delay was not within the intention of the regulations. Yeah, they cast off at four in the morning, four oh four in the morning, and they conducted the safety briefing. I think at eight in the morning. So by your, by what you're saying, that's not acceptable. Uh, we've already pointed out that that they had a on occasions they had a deckhand operating the vessel while the other crew members, including the captain and the second captain, were asleep. That happened on the conception. That's not legal. Um, and I am out of time, and so I will continue. But the, the, the line of questioning that I'm trying to make here is that we've got one deviation from procedures after another. And as Carrie Bell said, that's the normalization of deviance. I'll pick this up later, and we'll uh, go for the second round. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It was noted in the report uh, that after the Coast Guard and the U.S. District Attorney decided to pursue criminal charges, uh, NTSB access to crew and critical documents was uh, greatly diminished or, in fact, eliminated. Uh, could you explain how you managed to get around those constraints? Yeah, Vice Chairman, uh, thanks for the question. and. Um, 
That's correct. Um, while we were on scene, a search warrant was served uh, at Truth Aquatics, which uh, had uh, recovered numerous documents and um, and items from both the office and uh, and the vessel, both the sister vessel, the Vision and the Truth. Um, after that, the vessel owner, who was a party to this investigation, was not able to provide us anything, uh, basically because everything had been taken and seized. Um, however, uh, although it took some time, uh, we were able to access uh, certain documents, the documents that had been taken, uh, that was provided to us in February of 2020. Uh, so we were still able to get access to the materials and, uh, and documents and um, uh, so it, it didn't affect uh, the overall accuracy of this investigation and the issues. Okay, so, but it, it, it did delay us um, somewhat to be able to uh, get to everything that we needed to get to, is that correct? That is correct, sir, yes. Is it possible, do you think, uh, to pursue parallel investigations, criminal and safety, um, or criminal evaluation without one jeopardizing the other. And I realize that may be a little out of your wheelhouse, but you, you've been in this circumstance before and it seems like uh, we ought to be able to bifurcate those so that uh, we can get the safety information we need without uh, um, having the criminals, uh, criminal investigation chill uh, the response of people who do not want to self-incriminate, but they will talk to us. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, every accident is different. Every accident is unique. I do believe it is possible. However, um, once word gets out that there's a criminal investigation, uh, the challenge presents itself that there are a lot of people that are not wanting to really speak with us for fear of self-incrimination. Uh, and it, as mentioned earlier, it does delay in um, gathering of documents, materials, that uh, evidence. Um, and uh, there is certainly time that uh, is lost in the uh, providing of that material as well, as we saw with this case. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll uh, yield back the uh, balance of my time for the next round. Thank you. And you're quite welcome. Thank you very much. And Member Hamadi. Thank you very much. Um, just one quick follow up to my last round of questioning and member Graham's question on the safety inspection form. The safety inspection form was actually provided as part of the loss of loss control program packet, which apparently some people didn't get until after several trips. Uh, some crew members didn't get until after several trips uh with truth aquatics so you actually have to have access to an inspection form um to be able to know to fill it out but with that i want to get to the uh escape hatch a little bit uh, miss bell um did the safety briefing cover the escape hatches The safety briefing they had the, the day, the first day, or are you talking about the placards and safety briefing that they had? That the crew gave. Um, they did say that they did an abridged version of the safety briefing, um, but I believe that they did cover that. Okay. And uh, others had reported it's normal to cover the escape hatches and the safety briefing on on other trips, which in my opinion should have occurred before anyone got on board that vessel, including the night before. That's correct. So the night before when they first, the first night they, they got on board, they did not have the safety briefing that included the escape hatchet. That, that occurred the next day. And when they do the safety briefing and include the escape hatch, where do they show them that portion of the briefing, do they actually take them down into the bunk room and show them the uh, emergency escape hatch and how to access it and where it uh, uh, goes out to? They, are, they typically stand in the salon right where the emergency hatch is located above. So they don't take them down into the bunk and point those out. They just tell them that is where it is. 
Okay, can you pull up uh, page 39 of the presentation? So they don't go in the bunk room, which is on the left here. They actually stand up in the salon and point to the hatch. So do you think it's reasonable to assume that anyone would really understand where it is and what to do if you're just pointing at a piece of plywood on the second level? I would think that would be difficult. Yeah. Um, was there any thought by the company on who to put in the bunks, in the bunk room near the hatch? Uh, member how many I can answer that uh, the answer is no okay and I ask that because when I'm in an emergency exit row uh, on an airplane if I uh, you know put uh, two kids next to me uh, if I put my daughter next to me and an even younger uh, child uh, the flight attendant is going to say something and so uh, the flight attendants also going to ask uh, are you able to assist in an emergency evacuation? Is that a question anybody asks before the end of the safety briefing or while on board? Uh, Member Homan, the staff found that there was no evidence of that uh, question being asked of anybody. Okay. And um, how many people, according to the Certificate of Inspection or COI, could be on this vessel? How many were allowed? Uh, I can answer that, uh, Member Hamandi, uh, for the uh, certificate of inspection, mm -hmm. the uh, total number of passengers for overnight was um, uh, 46, and uh, the vessel may carry up to 99. That's just during day, day trips, not overnight. And 99 plus the crew for a total of 103. That is correct. So uh, even if they, the the uh, guests in the bunk room, even if there was an exit to another location, do you think it's possible for a rapid egress? Uh, Member Hominy, I'll uh, defer that to uh, our Survival Factors Group Chairman, uh, Mr. Marcel Muse. Uh, Member Hominy, th this arrangement would have been challenging um, for any number of people to get to get out uh, in a fire or with smoke or any emergency where people become disoriented and, and have to uh, climb through that hatch. Yeah, and if Mr. Chairman, if you'll allow me just a little bit uh, more time, I just want to show that that escape exit one more time, because I did go on the vision, and we turned the lights off because it would be dark, it would be smoky at that point, there would be some emergency lighting, but I think it would be very difficult to see given what is there. You have to go up the ladder, across the bunk. And while it may look, you might easily be able to fit there. You actually have to, and I'm I'm five four. I'm not I'm not a big person. You know, I had to flip on my back and push the escape hatch up. The one of the um, another NTSB uh, staffer, Eric Strickland, was with me. He's a foot taller than me. It's not an easy easy to escape area. And so I would say rapid egress would be very difficult. So I'm going to ask one more question, and that's did anyone, anyone, whether it was the owner, the Coast Guard, because this, this vessel goes back to 1980, did anyone say, hey, that might be a bad idea? We have no evidence that the uh, there was any plan review that, that said one way or the other. Uh, we do know other than one piece of paper that said the initial inspector had to crawl through every egress uh, and make it work. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me some a little bit of uh, some leeway there. That, that's good. Thank you very much, uh, Member Hamadi. And uh, you you answered uh, or asked a lot of questions that I think we all had. So thank you very, very much. And Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to go back to the safety briefing really quick. Uh, we talked about it happened uh, hours after they had boarded the boat, slept on the boat, proceeded out to the uh, first anchor spot, and then they were briefed. Um, did the 
during the course of the the investigation, did the Coast Guard say anything about when the safety briefing was given when that when that was uh, found out? I think you're muted. I apologize. Uh, I will defer that to uh, our operations group chairman, uh, Mr. Andrew Ellers. Uh, yes, sir. No, we did not. Uh, get any feedback from the Coast Guard. Uh, we did not ask the Coast Guard directly that question, um, but we did not get any feedback from Coast Guard on that. Okay, thank you. I know the new, tager, new T regulations state that a safety briefing card can be used instead, and I think they had a pamphlet, but that had some safety information on it. Obviously, it didn't have like EMER exits and things like that on it, but um, it does state in there that an abbreviated announcement must be made prior to getting underway if you use a, a, a briefing card. Um, was any announcement made before getting underway? We don't believe there was an announcement made because all the passengers were asleep and uh, the vessel got underway and proceeded immediately across the ocean. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to switch over to uh, talking about the, the salon area and the smoke detectors. Um, we, in the presentation, you say the likely uh, source of the uh, fire was the aft portion of the salon. Uh, we know there wasn't a smoke detector in the salon, but was there any other kind of de detector in the salon? Uh, Member Graham, there was a, uh, a heat detector in the galley above the, uh, the griddle. Above the griddle. And um, when would that detector go off? Uh, it was specifically a heat detector, and uh, it was designed just to detect heat uh, directly over that uh, griddle. And uh, I'll defer that to, uh, I believe, uh, Joe Panagiotu, our fire and explosions uh, group chairman for that one. Um, that detector was designed to go off when the temperature near the detector reached or exceeded approximately 135 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, we don't know if that detector went off, and we don't have any record of its operational status. Um, a, a crew member did state in one of the interviews that he thought he heard a faint alarm sound while he was on the upper deck, but he couldn't pinpoint where that was coming from. It may have been that detector, but we, we don't know. Well, my next question would be, I don't know if I heard, I read that same thing and said there might have heard a chirp, which would have been probably the smoke detector, but did the heat detector, what was its sound? Do we know? And do we know the crew, if the crew even knew what the sound of a heat detector going off is? I don't believe so because there was no, no uh, policy or schedule for really testing and uh, demonstrating its uh, operation. Okay. Yeah. So that that's a concern. If crew members don't know what the sound is, or passengers don't know what the sound of a smoke detector or a heat detector is, how are they going to know that there's an emergency? Um, it's amazing that we have an unattended room that has battery chargers on it, a flat top griddle, two burners, refrigerators, and we have no regulations that require a smoke detector in there. Just amazing. Um, we know uh, the smoke detectors in the bunk room uh, can provide early protection or early warning of a fire. That's only if the fire is in that space, as you've already said. So um, by the time the uh, fire was out of control, it was, it was probably too late for those down in the bunk room to evacuate. So looking, uh, I'm looking at some recommendations you're going to make here in just a little bit, and I hope we adopt these today. But uh, we've, we're asking the Coast Guard to revise the regulations to require all vessels with overnight accommodations to install smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces. I would hope that we that the Coast Guard would take take us up on this recommendation and make it a regulation. But I do know it takes time, so I would ask those other operators out there who have boats just like this that a two-pack of battery-powered smoke detectors cost $25 at the local hardware store. And I plead with you to go ahead and get these and install them before the regulation comes out in all of your spaces so we don't have a tragedy like this again. And I see my time's up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Quite welcome, Member Graham and uh, Member Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I have some questions about batteries, and I recognize that unintended, uh, unintended charging of batteries couldn't be definitively established as the ignition source. Uh, nevertheless, the circumstances of this accident highlight the danger of unintended charging uh, of batteries. Uh, the draft report indicates the Coast Guard issued a marine safety information bulletin shortly after the conception fire. And as one of the various recommended, uh, recommended actions the Coast Guard bulletin includes, uh, one of those uh, recommendations is, and I'm quoting, limiting the unsupervised charging of lithium ion batteries and extensive use of power strips and extension cords. And of course, that's the, the circumstances that uh, I think the investigation uh, indicates uh, was uh, was a factor, a potential factor in terms of the ignition source for this fire. Um, so my question is, are there existing Coast Guard regulations which apply to how or where batteries should be charged on board passenger vessels or under what circumstances battery charging should be limited? Uh, Member Chapman, uh, staff did not find any uh any regulations for small passenger vessels related to uh, to the uh, uh, charging and storage of lithium ion batteries, no. And, and is battery charging on board passenger vessels, especially in light of what we know about this accident, uh, is that an activity that Coast Guard should consider regulating? I know that's a little bit unfair because we're not in the regulating business, but if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, well, as, uh, as you'd mentioned, um, we were not able to find a definitive source related to uh, the charging of lithium ion batteries. Um, it is an area of concern. It is uh, definitely in the uh, the area of concern of the Coast Guard, uh, considering they did issue an, an, an MSIB, uh, Marine Safety Information Bulletin on it. And um, so, you know, I, I do believe it is, a, is something that warrants it, yes. Um. The FAA at its technical center in Atlantic City has conducted significant research into the risks of lithium ion batteries. And I've had the, had the privilege, frankly, of seeing some of their work and it's, 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 it's quite impressive. Do you know whether Coast Guard is aware of FAA's work in this area? Um, and has Coast Guard uh, coordinated in any way with FAA subject matter experts? Uh, Member Chapman, I am not aware. Um, and, uh, Mr. Paniotu, do you have any, uh, information further? Um, no, I don't know if there has been any coordination, but, uh, some of those risks are slightly different. Um, the FAA does look a lot at the, um, the bulk carriage of, uh, batteries and that hazard is, is different than the singular or multiple personal devices that may be found charging on a vessel. So they're, they're slightly different hazards, but I don't know if there has been any coordination between the two. Yeah, that's a very good, I'm sorry. I, I have some lawn mowers outside my window here. I'm messing with my microphone. Yeah, you're, you're correct. That's a, it's a different focus in terms of FAA's research, but it does have some crossover. Um, well, in light of the distinct possibility that batteries were the ignition source, I do want to encourage, and I and I recognize there are limitations here because we weren't we weren't able to de uh, determine that uh, definitively. But I do want to encourage the various passenger vessel associations to draw attention to the potential dangers of unattended battery charging. If they haven't done so already, uh, associations I believe should share the circumstances of the conception accident with their members and encourage them to limit the unsupervised charging of lithium ion batteries and the extensive use of power strips and extension cords. And we saw that frightening photo, frankly, which is part of the presentation, which I think illustrates clearly why this is a concern. Thank you. Member Chapman, thank you very much. I want to follow up and continue the line of questioning that I had earlier about how well Truth Aquatics adhere to their own procedures. And we started on that line of questioning and then my time ran out. So let's continue along that line. Uh, a question is, well, really a statement is, uh, as I understand it, the second captain, the first 
deckhand and the second galley hand told investigators that they had never participated in a fire drill. Now, bear in mind that the uh, deckhand had been on conception for around 10 months, and the second galley hand had been there for about two years. So according to U.S. Coast Guard regulations, should these life-saving drills have been conducted by these crew members? Now, Mr. Chairman, uh, Operations Group Chairman uh, Andrew Ellis will answer that. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, the, the regulations don't give a periodicity for how often the drill should be done. I believe it says regularly. Uh, so, given the length of time that the second galley hand and the first deckhand had been on board, uh, yes, those drills had, should have been run at some time during their time on board. So, there's yet one more data point of how Truth Aquatics was really running, dis despite the fact that everybody felt they were the safest boat on the, uh, in the water. Uh, Truth Aquatics had a, uh, a loss control problem a program that stated that training records were required to be kept in the company's shoreside office. Uh, what did you find out about the company's uh, about, about the training records? We found uh, no training records pertaining to the the crew. We do know that they conducted the company conducted regular CPR and first aid training, but other training records were not kept. And the reason they weren't found, according to the owner, was because the records were kept where? On board the vessel. On board the vessel, whereas the requirement was they would be kept in their onboard, on their uh, shoreside uh, office. Um, regulations require that a PA system be audible in passenger accommodation spaces. Uh, what did your investigation reveal about the status, the likely status of the PA on board conception? We found, uh, I believe on the vision, that the PA system had been disconnected in the uh, birthing area uh, so that people who were, the reason given was that so that people sleeping in that area would not be bothered by routine announcements. Um, we don't know what the status was on the conception, but it's certainly possible that it was also disconnected. Yeah, so on the identical sister ship, it had been, it, it had been disconnected, and isn't it true that uh, that in a prior Coast Guard inspection, uh, the Coast Guard inspectors did find that the PA system in the bunk room for conception had actually been disconnected. Did I read that correctly? Yes, I believe that's correct. And finally, we know and we've established that the COR, COI required a roving patrol. And I list each of these deviations to really paint a picture. There's a data point here and a data point here and a data point here, one after another. And, and there's a grim picture. It's a picture of a charter boat company that repeatedly disregarded its procedures. And most critical of those deviations, in my opinion, was the failure to require a roving patrol, because that, in my opinion, contributed to the high loss of life. It's also a picture of a calm Pacific Ocean on Labor Day morning in the pre-dawn hours where the ocean is illuminated by the bright glow of a fire on board the Conception that unfortunately claimed 34 lives. It's a very grim picture. And so Kerry Bell talked about the normalization of deviance. That's where you start deviating from this and this little one and this little one, and before long, there's a lot of deviations that mount up to a very large thing. So I'll uh, yield the rest of my time. Uh, we will go into the third round and Vice Chairman Landsberg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is probably for uh, Mr. Muse. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the escape um, hatches and, and so forth. And I think Member Hammondy very eloquently described the difficulty of this particular hatch. And the fact of the matter is that if you have a hatch that is essentially unusable, uh, unless somebody is in superb physical condition, which I think with, with divers, perhaps that's a little better, but for the majority of Americans these days, uh, some of us might need to spend a little more time um, getting into better shape. Is there any guidance whatsoever on the ability to actually operate and use these hatches? 
There's nothing in the regulations that talks about usability or demonstrating uh, actually using the hatches. The new T regulations are a little bit more specific than the older ones clarifying issues such as obstructions, um, in some cases prohibiting ladders. Um, and, and the biggest difference is the width that's um, allowed. So there is a minimum width on newer vessels, uh, 32 inches. Um, and there's, there's some other requirements as well. Well, I but guess- not demonstration as you ask. Yeah, I would guess that the, the width is a tacit recognition that uh, we are as a, a people um, becoming larger. But I also think uh, there ought to be something that addresses the complete usability of these hatches uh, or escape uh, areas, because otherwise it, it's fine if all the able-bodied people are, are able to get out, but the uh, others do not. Uh, I'd like to delve into the electronic side here just a little bit, and I realize that we cannot fully ascertain exactly what happened, but could you discuss a little bit um, uh, circuit breakers and charging stations, um, uh, perhaps on why a circuit breaker would not provide protection under what we think might have happened um, in, in this fire? Vice Chairman, uh, Mr. Paniyotu, uh, fire and explosions, he'd be able to answer that. Thank you. Um, yes, as you pointed out, we, we don't know if it was indeed a battery, but uh, a circuit breaker is going to provide overload protection, which means that the, the current draw on the circuit that's being protected exceeds the designed value. When a battery fails in the charger, it does not necessarily draw. It's not because there's a high current draw. It is an internal failure of the battery because perhaps the charger is trying to overcharge it or just internally there's a failure in the battery. So a circuit breaker wouldn't really interrupt that process. Um, okay. Do you think that there should be designated charging stations uh, aboard vessels, perhaps in close proximity to uh, smoke or fire detectors that would alarm if something overheated? Um, I guess, you know, we, there could be a requirement saying that the you can't charge um, a device unless somebody's awake. Well, we've already had the discussion about the roving watch person, but um, is there is there a technical solution here possibly? Again, I'm speculating slightly because we don't know that this is exactly the case, but your thoughts? Um, there are technical solutions. There are cabinets that could be used for charging, um, which, would in, which would contain any fire uh, resulting from a thermal runaway of a battery. Um, it could be done in areas that are monitored by smoke detectors, uh, which, which would catch it early also. Uh, like, like you pointed out, it could be limited to times when there are crew members uh, awake and um, there to, to notice that a fire has started. Uh, and also, one could could think about where they are doing this and maybe not do it in an area that is going to be part of an escape path. Do it in an area that would not be part of an escape. So that, that would mitigate the hazard also. So, th so there are many things that could be done. So, yeah, so that's the point. I think there are, now that we know what we know about lithium ion batteries, which uh, member Chapman has uh, uh, also uh, very clearly stated in some of the demonstrations we've seen uh, by the FAA at the Tech Center and uh, also circumstances on board uh, commercial airliners where somebody's personal electronic device uh, caught fire and the challenges that the crew had to have and move quickly in order to resolve it. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, we, we need to start paying more attention on uh, vessels as we do on aircraft. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vice right, Chairman, you're quite welcome. And Member Hamadi. Thank you very much. And um, Mr. Ehlers, I have some questions for you. Uh, and I'm going to pick up where the Chairman left off on operations. Uh, the what were the company documents for safety? Were there a, was there any sort of operations manual or safety manual other than this loss control, which was really about loss prevention? 
Yeah, no, there was no documents. When we interviewed the owner, he said that that was the purview of the captains of the vessels. So other than the loss control program, we didn't find any documents that uh, pertain to safety. And when you say purview of the of the of the captain, you mean you don't mean purview as in the captain has to come up with a safety manual, but the captain is directly responsible for safety. Th that's correct. Okay. In the loss control uh, document that the company hands out, it says we strive. I'm quoting on the first page, second page. We strive to attain a high level of safety in all activities. And keep that in mind when I ask you the following questions. In an interview, you asked excellent questions of the owner of Truth Aquatics. You asked him, uh, do they, for all your crews, do they regularly drill uh, for emergencies? He said, yes. Is that true? Based on the responses we got from crew members, no, that wasn't the case. Um, again, as we spoke with the first deckhand, second deckhand, excuse me, second captain and second galley hand, they had said that they hadn't done a fire drill, which is one of the required drills on board the vessel. Yeah, in fact, you went on to say, does that emergency drill include fire? Yes. And then you ask, do you have, do they keep logs of those emergency drills? He says, the owner, that's up to the captain. Then you ask about policies and procedures. He says, uh, I'd have to look, maybe, you know, basically he says, could be something on board the vessel. Then you ask um, about uh, watch standing procedures. No, the company doesn't have any. You ask about company-wide proce procedures, and he responds, that's all run by the captain. And then later again, you ask, when was the last time you were on the boat? Because it's been a while. Can't recall. Where is uh, Truth Aquatics located where the boat is? How close? It's, uh, it's very close. Basically, the office is right at the landing where the docks are, where the boats are moored. Yeah, it's maybe a matter of feet. So question, uh, when, and then you ask him, when passengers board the vessels, divers board the vessel, are they given a, safe, a safety briefing? Yes. Then you say, and when that safety briefing is conducted, is it conducted before the vessel gets underway? He says, I'd have to refer that to the captain. So here's my question, and, the, and his answers are consistent. Because in the loss control prevention document, he says, cap it says, captains of each vessel will be directly responsible for maintaining safe working conditions and practices and for the safety of passengers and crew crewmen under the supervision. If you're the owner of a company, who's responsible for safety at the end of the day? Ultimately, it is the company. And, and the yep, it is the company. And... Here's what concerns me, and the chairman hinted at this. There are a lot of people we interviewed, who said, including the Coast Guard, who said that Truth Aquatics and the company owner had a good reputation for being good operators. They were always more than willing to engage in conversation about vessel operations. We've had a good relationship with them. And then a customer had said they were considered to be the top dive boat outfitter and a former captain said, described them as the safest boats on the coast, coast. But I've heard throughout this investigation that this is just how things are run. A lot of companies defer things to the captain of the vessel. Do you think that's a great way to run your company if you're the one responsible for safety? No. No. So after this... Um, fire, and I hate the term accident in this case, because in my opinion, it's not an accident if you fail to operate your company safely. Um, the After the uh, fire occurred, uh, he the Truth Aquatics made some changes, and I'm, I'm almost done. Um, what changes were made to vision? And that's the question, is what yeah. changes were made to vision? Uh, 
they have uh, installed a an egg, another exit in the bunk room going to the weather decks, uh, and they have installed a fire detection system, and then also a, a an extensive fire detection system, and then also a recharging box for cell phone and, and battery recharging. Things that could have been done before anyone uh, perished in an accident. Thank you very much. Member Homedy, thank you very much. And Member Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to talk about or ask some questions about the uh, regulations uh, and especially as they pertain to the emergency hatch. And I appreciate Member Homedy talking about the emergency hatch. Uh, I did watch the YouTube uh, channel of uh, your staff member going through that hatch and I don't see how a average human with a life jacket on could uh, get up through that hatch, actually get to it to begin with. It'd be rather difficult and get through that. Um, without being a contortionist. So um, the, the, uh, the team here is going to uh, propose a recommendation to, to the board that we uh, uh, take up that requires all small passenger vessels, including those constructed prior to 1996, to provide a secondary means of escape into a different, different space other than the primary exit. And I support this recommendation. If the, my question is, is if a vessel was constructed prior to 1996, as was the conception, when does 46 CFR part 177 apply to the alteration or modifications made to an existing vessel? Uh, Member Graham, uh, Mr. Muse, our survival factors group chairman can answer that. So uh, Member Graham, that determination will be made by the local, um, the local officer in charge of marine inspection, uh, they might defer that to the Marine Safety Center where the Coast Guard has naval architects to do plan review. Um, but ultimately, a major conversion would be a decision that would be made um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, so yeah, so I want to talk about that. So it's a, a major conversion. So how does Part 177 define a major conversion? Do you have that by, by chance? I do not, sorry, man. Okay, well, I'm going to read it because I have it here. I have some questions on it. Major conversion means a conversion of a vessel that is determined by the commandant, one, substantially changes the dimensions of carrying capacity of the vessel, two, changes the type of vessel, three, substantially prolongs the life of the vessel, or four, otherwise so changes the vessel that it is essentially a new vessel. So would the construction of a new secondary means of escape such as an escape hatch being considered, is that being considered a major conversion according to Part 177? It, it very well might. Uh, the additional exits that were installed on the vision, uh, I understand have yet to be approved uh, by the Coast Guard for that very reason. Are they operating with it the way it is right now? They are not operating it right now, but that's probably because of the, the current pandemic issues. Okay. Because that would be through what a, a watertight barrier, would it not, to the uh, floor of the, the main deck? It would be. Yes. Okay, that, that's uh, I was trying to understand that. So, um, if the construction of a new emergency hatch is is subjected to the new T regulation, what part of one what does Part 177 say about the size of the escape hatch? The escape hatches have to be uh, a minimum of 32 inches or uh, one third of an inch per person that has to uh, escape through there. That's for obviously for larger, larger vessels. Um, deck scuttles are allowed to be 18 inches. Um, okay. And it also says something about must be suffi sufficient for rapid evacuation in an emergency for the number of persons served. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. Okay. So, um, how is rapid evacuation determined? It, it's not further defined or discussed anywhere in the regulations. Once again, it's not defined, yeah. Um, also, does uh, Part 177 say anything about the dimensions of this? Well, it does say something about the uh, escape hatch and everything, um, but does it talk anything about uh, allowing a ladder uh, and the means uh, to an emergency exit, you, the use of a ladder? Ladders are not the best tool to use for egress just because some people can't physically use them, especially if they're injured or disoriented. Uh, for that reason, they're not allowed uh, on vessels over, I believe, it's 65 feet or 20 meters. Yeah, I think I saw that. So would what the vision put on 
uh, a, a new escape hatch, would that meet that part 177? It might not, no, for that re very reason. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And I see I just have a few seconds. I just want to make a statement about the roving patrol. As many of you know, I spent some time in the Navy. I'm a former naval aviator, and I spent all my time at sea on an aircraft carrier, which is basically made of steel. And even then, with 5,000-plus people on board, operations uh, may slow a little bit. But even then, we have roving patrols always looking for anything out of the ordinary, and definitely fire. And a matter of fact, everybody on board an aircraft carrier is required to be trained in fighting fires, and they're required to do recurrent training every 18 months. So the fact that this boat had no roving patrol uh, is uh, just astonishing to me. To me. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. You're, you're quite welcome, and uh, thank you very much. And the fact that uh, people would think that uh, you could uh, – be a, have uh, crew members asleep in the bunk room is uh, astonishing as well uh, for for to to meet the satisfaction of uh, the roving patrol. Uh, Member Chapman, you're recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, today we'll consider a draft recommendation calling on Coast Guard to revise its regulations to require all vessels with overnight accommodations to have interconnected smoke detectors. And I intend to support the adoption of that recommendation. Just to, to help us understand the context, what do we know about the relative complexity of interconnected smoke detector systems, and can such systems be adapted to the varying sizes and configurations of smaller passenger vessel, vessels such as the Conception? Yeah, Member Chapman, uh, our fire and explosions uh, uh, group chairman, Joe Panakiotu, uh, would be able to answer that. Um, interconnected smoke detectors are, are not complex smoke detectors. The only difference between them and the standard smoke detector is that they communicate with each other. That could be achieved um, wirelessly or even hardwired, uh, depending on how, the choice you make as to what you want system you want to use. The, the good thing about it is that in a, in a vessel with multiple compartments, instead of each detector needing to wait until the conditions nearby it are such that it goes into alarm, once one of them goes into alarm, they all will go into alarm. That will notify everybody on the vessel. That way, passengers can begin evacuating, crew can begin fighting the fire or assisting the passenger evacuation. It's a, it's a very large improvement over just the standard smoke detector, and it's not much more expensive or more complicated. So these systems are readily available, and they're, they're essentially they're off-the-shelf systems. Is that correct? Yes. On a related uh, uh, line, the uh, the draft report indicates that Truth Aquatics acted following the fire to install relatively sophisticated fire detection systems in its remaining vessels. Can you explain the distinction between um, what I understand are, are those more robust fire detection systems? and the integrated smoke detector systems referenced in the draft recommendation we'll consider? Um, are, are you asking about what Truth Aquatics installed? My, my understanding is that they installed a more, a, a more robust fire detection system. Is that what we're referencing in the recommendation? No, we're not. Um, what I believe Truth Aquatics did was installed a system that also monitored heat detectors in the engine room would close dampers for the engine room in order to contain the carbon dioxide system if it was to activate. Um, that is not what we're asking for. We're, we're merely asking for smoke detectors that are interconnected to be installed in all the accommodation spaces. So while we wouldn't discourage an operator from installing that sort of a system, that's not what we're recommending today is sort of the baseline um, uh, a measure to try to address the concern about smoke detectors, correct? Correct. A question about uh, safety management systems. Um, and, and I support uh, reiterating the recommendation as we will do later today, calling for operators of all U.S. flag passenger vessels to implement safety management systems. I'm a big believer in safety management systems. While the idea makes sense in the abstract, I, I wonder if you could describe what a safety management system might look like uh, for the sort of relatively small operator 
uh, and vessels involved in this tragedy. Uh, Member Chapman, uh, uh, our group chairman for operations, uh, Mr. Ellers will be able to answer that. Yes, Member Chapman, for this vessel uh, and this size company, the SMS does not need to be uh, voluminous. It doesn't need to be large. Um, in fact, uh, one of the uh, industry associations for small passenger vessels has a template in which their members can use, um, but it would con uh, contain the basic procedures, both normal operations and emergency operations. And because it's a small vessel, there isn't a number of procedures, there's some ba very basic procedures. Uh, it would contain um, the procedures for reporting uh, accidents and and figuring out how to prevent them. And it would uh, contain an audit process to make sure that the company management is overseeing uh, the vessels and ensuring that they are following policies, procedures, et cetera. So the, the, the key here is system. There needs to be a systematic approach to safety. And, and this, this doesn't have to be complicated. It can be a relatively simple framework, but there needs to be uh, something in place that ensures that systemic approach, correct? Yes, correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Actually, that's my last question this, this afternoon. Member Chapman, thank you very much. I, I do want to return to the issue of talking about the lithium battery fires. I realize that we cannot say for sure what uh, may have caused this, this fire, but given that the sister ship, the uh, Vision, 11 months earlier, 10 months earlier, had a fire on board from charging lithium batteries, and given the propensity of lithium batteries to overheat and to go into thermal runaway, um, I do want to probe that. So after the vision fire, uh, the, the passenger who owned the flashlight that caused this, this, uh, this event on the vision, he said uh, that, the, that the captain of the vision ordered that no more nighttime charging would be allowed. And so that's what that captain said. But I want to circle back because I, I want to, there's been discussion. The owner of the company, the owner of Truth Aquatic says that no one told him. But yet apparently the captain of that, of the vision did say that he told the owner. So let's, let's put a little bit more light on that, please. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, that is correct. Uh, the owner, um, he did state that he was not informed of that fire uh, in October 2018 on the vision. You know, I, I'm sort of incredulous about that because given the severity of a fire on board a vessel, uh, you would think that the owner would be notified of that. I, um, uh, one of the tenets or one of the traits of a safety culture is a reporting culture. And so um, according to um, an interview of one of the passengers who was on, who, who actually pitched, uh, took this uh, battery charger and tossed it overboard, uh, he said that uh, the captain took pictures. He said that the, a fire, that a fire extinguisher was discharged and that most notably um, this passenger told NTSB investigators that a few trips later, apparently this, this person was a frequent traveler on board the uh, Truth Aquatics vessels. He said uh, a tr few trips later, he could still see the black burn marks in the wood on the shelf, but he noted on a later trip, one after that, that the marks were no longer there. That would indicate that what what might the fact that the marks just fade away or did did they actually have to replace the wood or did somebody go out and scrub them what do we know about that uh, mr chairman we do not know um any any further detail on those charring marks but yes the fact that a, a fire extinguisher was discharged that indicates that's a pretty serious event um how would the owner of the company not know they ostensibly had to recharge that fire extinguisher? You would think that there'd be an invoice or something for the recharging of a fire fire extinguisher. What do we know about that? Yes, Anything? correct. Um, it, it, the fire extinguisher was discharged. The, uh, the witness said it was a shot, so it was not a complete discharge. However, you're correct. Uh, there should be some invoice or some type of refill effort uh, undertaken there. 
uh, again, the owner, um, he did affirm that uh, he was not aware of this, uh, of this event. Well, thank you. According to the Conception Second Galley Hand, uh, charging of these devices was not unusual. Uh, that's uh, d uh, in spite of the fact that the Vision had a had this event a year earlier. He said on this on this uh, this fatal voyage, there were 17 night divers the evening before the fire, which included 10 people uh, had cameras, flashlights, strobes. Many of the devices were wet. Uh, one crew member said that there were 10 to 20 of these devices on one table, power strips, cell phones. Uh, he did acknowledge that not all were, char uh, were plugged in. The, uh, another galley hand who was supposed to be on this trip, she was actually the daughter of the second galley hand of the uh, accident voyage. Uh, she, she worked there for over two years, and, she, and this is a quote from her. But, but people are going to charge it because if you start pulling people's stuff, they've paid a grand to come on the boat and you just unplug the thing. And they're like, well, I, I don't get to use that now. And you get into trouble for pulling something. She was saying that because she had uh, potential concerns. Uh, and so she was expressing that you don't want to go unplugging these things because it makes the customers mad. And then you get into trouble. Uh, I've got, uh, so I'm going to just, uh, finish it up. I'm out of time. But I talked to Tom Chapin of UL. UL Tom is a an expert on lithium batteries. He's devoted his, his life to exploring these. He says, battery packs used in recreational and diving activities may be exposed to high levels of mechanical impact, salt water, and or temperature extremes that might make them more susceptible to internal short circuit and thermal runaway. Other factors may include non-OEM or counterfeit chargers that would be that would exacerbate the risk of internal short circuit through mismatched DC charging voltage. And you know, the, the idea of lithium batteries catching on fire is not new. We see on TV hoverboards exploding, burning houses down. Samsung Galaxy Note 7 had to be basically banned from airplanes because of these battery problems. E-cigarettes catching fire. At least two cargo planes, we're talking Boeing 747s, that were that were brought down by bulk shipment of lithium batteries, vape pens catching fires. Um, so this is something that needs to be taken very seriously. Again, we can't say for certain what may have led to this fire, but we do know that the Vision had a fire earlier. We do know that on this accident voyage, there were several that were plugged in. So the batteries can reach anywhere when they catch fire, anywhere between 900 and 1,000 degrees. And you would think, you would think that the owners and operators would realize the potential dangers of charging these devices. So we are going to take a break. I'd like to invite... Uh, all participants to please uh, mute your, turn off your cameras and your mics. There will be more questions after the break. Uh, I'd like for each board member to text me uh, about how many more rounds of question questions they anticipate. Uh, and we will reconvene on East Coast time at 3.20, which of course on the West Coast time would be 12.20. So we are... In recess, we'll see you in 17 minutes.
Okay, we are back in session. And Vice Chairman, uh, you're up next. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just have a question. One thing that sort of um, seems kind of obvious, as uh, Member Chapman indicated, the requirement for a roving night watchman has been around for almost uh, 150 years. It was noted in the report that the Coast Guard had not issued any violations for almost 30 years. Do they have any idea or does anybody have any idea on how to deal with this, particularly as we get more technology? Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, yes, staff has made recommendations and uh, I will uh, have uh, Mr. Andrew Ellers uh, answer that question. Sir, as, as you pointed out, um, in with modern technologies, there may be better ways in which that the Coast Guard can verify that roving patrol watches have been found or can be uh, verified. So our recommendation has been specifically designed to allow the Coast Guard that flexibility to determine the best way uh, to verify that the roving patrol watch happens, but absolutely to make sure that it happens. Okay. Last, uh, this is more a statement than a, than a question, but um, uh, as the chairman has pointed out, um, and as uh, uh, we've, we've heard mentioned, the so-called uh, normalization of deviance. What it really boils down to is failure to follow procedure. And in multiple areas, we see that. And Truth Aquatics was recognized as one of the best operators out there. And so the question comes up of what's, what's kind of the standard of, of operation for all of the other operators who may not have measured up to the perceived uh, standard that Truth Aquatics did, and how does the Coast Guard plan to deal with that? Um, coming from the aviation industry, we've worked really hard to try to get these things uh, addressed, and um, I agree with the chairman. You know, this is this is a most unfortunate situation, and the fact that nothing has happened for decades on these boats, or little things have happened, doesn't mean that we were doing it right. It means we were lucky. Um, no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. And uh, as I understand it at this time, uh, neither members uh, Graham nor Chapman have any additional questions. You're always welcome to uh, to pose more. Uh, but for now, and if you do need to make uh, ask more questions, just raise your hand electronically. Uh, for now, I'll call on uh, Member Homedy. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Mr. Tucker, uh, there were six crew members on board, captain, second captain, first deck hand, second deck hand, and first and second galley hand. Out of those six crew members, who were the deck crew? Who were considered deck crew? Out of the uh, six crew members, that would have been the, the captain, the second captain, the uh, first deck hand, and the second deck hand. Okay. Uh, so then I have some questions for Dr. McKay. Dr. McKay, uh, what drugs were the deck crew uh, tested for? So, uh, Member Hominy, thanks for the question. So all of the deck crew were tested for the 15 required drugs in urine. So we're looking for urine metabolites of the 15 drugs in the DHS panel, which is identical to the DOT panel, which includes cocaine, PCP, methamphetamine, a host of opiates, and a host of other sympathomimetics. Primarily, these are drugs of abuse. And in fact, the panel is designed to only include Schedule One and Schedule Two drugs uh, in the DEA's controlled substance uh, group. And those are those are part of the regulations, both under DHS and DOT. So uh, for so for the four deck crew, for captain, second captain, first deck hand, and second deck hand, 
Were any of them positive for alcohol or drugs? They were not. Negative. So my question is, finding one, which will be discussed later, states um, the use of alcohol or other drugs by the conception deck crew likely was not a factor in the accident. Why do we say likely? Because it, they tested negative. Well, they tested negative for a very limited set of drugs of abuse. And the issue in this particular accident, it really goes to the, the underlying issue is that the interpretation of toxicology is not limited to the toxicology numbers. It also requires an understanding of the operational environment and the questions in this particular accident. In this particular accident, we don't know when the fire started. We don't know, we know it spread rapidly, but we don't know exactly how rapidly. And if one of the deck crew had taken an over-the-counter sedating antihistamine to enhance his ability to sleep through the night and delayed his awakening by five minutes, would that have contributed to the outcome in this accident? So it really has to do with the intersection of all of the drugs that were not tested for as well as all of the uncertainty in the operational side of this particular event. Well, I, I appreciate that, but there are drugs listed in the regulations, which you've listed, DHS and DOT have, that are required for testing. If they're not listed in those, they're not required for testing. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I have not seen a situation in other reports, whether it was Tempe, Arizona, whether it was with which in Tempe, Arizona, that was an evaluation by a DRE. There wasn't an actual urine test. And then in Cary, Ohio, we just considered an accident where the eastbound crew was tested, where there was no, they were negative for these same drugs, and we did we never said likely when it came to the eastbound crew. So, so why are we changing that here? Just so, because they could there could have been anything else over the counter in their system that we don't know about because it's not required for testing. So the issue in Cary, Ohio was the eastbound crew was not at fault. The westbound crew was at fault. And in fact the westbound engineer was found to be full of alcohol primarily, and evidence of past use of THC, the psychoactive compound. I'm not talking about the westbound crew, eastbound crew. Right, but the east, eastbound crew was not at fault. So even if they had evidence of use of some drug in their system, it didn't contribute to the accident circumstances. The same thing is true in Tempe, Arizona. In Tempe, Arizona, the, um, what do they call it? The driver of the automatic vehicle, the safety driver in the automatic vehicle was found to be watching a video on her cell phone. There is no drug that makes you watch a video on your cell phone. So we were comfortable saying, even if she had been using some substance, that it didn't contribute to the circumstances of the accident. And that's really the crux of things here. The In this case, if one of these I mean, these guys were literally sleeping on top of a smoldering fire. Then there were flames. There was smoke coming up. By the time the captain made the call from the bridge, he was almost unable to speak because there was so much smoke. He said, I can't breathe. I understand that. So, and I understand what their responsibility is for the accident. What I don't want is people to walk away thinking, they could have been positive for drugs when they clearly tested negative for drugs. They just tested because, negative for just a short because list. You think, just because we think, investigators think, that it could be any possibility that there's something else out there that they're not tested for, which I think is an unfair standard. So uh, thank you. I do have an amendment on this, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate your time. I'm out of I'm out of time, and I'll. Uh, turn it back over to the chairman. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so we have discussed that uh, a safety management system could have been very useful for Truth Aquatics for a number of reasons. 
uh, but for one one of the reasons is it provides a, a feedback loop and it provides for auditing uh, to see how you're actually doing. So uh, as I understand it, uh, Congress mandated in 2010 that the Coast Guard begin rulemaking on safety management systems for small passenger vessels. And yet here we are 10 years later. And what activity has the Coast Guard taken to initiate this rulemaking? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer that to our uh, uh, safety recommendations, uh, Mr. Uh, Scott Rainey. Mr. Chairman, uh, we recently received uh, a response from the Coast Guard uh, dated October uh, 2nd of this year that staff is currently uh, evaluating. But um, in that response, the Coast Guard has uh, reported that they have initiated a rulemaking project for safety management systems on small passenger vessels, and that has been published and included in their spring 2020 unified agenda of regulatory and deregulatory actions. The Coast Guard is preparing an advance notice of proposed rulemaking to request public comment on SMS rule for small passenger vessels. And in February of this year, the Coast Guard issued the Marine Safety Information Bulletin 3-20, uh, which provides resources for voluntarily establishing a safety management system uh, and encouraging the voluntary implementation of SMS for all small passenger vessels. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, staff is currently evaluating the Coast Guard's uh, recent response to uh, safety recommendation M12-3 that we are recommending reiterating in this report. Thank you, Mr. Rainey. And uh, the bottom line is they've not even published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. Is that correct? Yes, that is. I want to remind people that just a few months ago, we this board excoriated the Federal Aviation Administration for not implementing uh, a rule in that case, the pilot records database that was also mandated by Congress in 2010. We, we excoriated the FAA, and for a good reason, because had they done that, that accident may not have happened. Well, by the same token, if there had been a safety management system that required auditing, re required a feedback loop, we may not be here today and those 34 people would be. So what are we gonna do about that? I think we need to send a very strong message to the US Coast Guard. I, I had a very nice conversation with the Commandant of the Coast Guard yesterday, and, and they, they want to do things to improve safety, but this is ridiculous. 10 years after Congress mandated it, no visible action. So I'll just terminate my question, my round of questions right there, and I'll re return to uh, Member Hamadi. You're up next. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to actually come back on that. What is the average time time for Coast Guard to respond to our recommendation? Our, any our recommendations in general. Uh, Member Hamadi, uh, Mr. Rainey can answer that. Member Hamadi, in the last uh, five years, uh, basically since the uh, sinking of the El Faro in October 2015, uh, on average, approximately six months on the initial responses. Six months. In fact, I see that they that there's even one recommendation on the El Faro that <laughs> they responded, and it was just something nonsensical from 19 from the 1980s and we said no we really want you to respond to this and they still haven't responded so it's open to wait response so looking at their response um uh and and i have a a list here of elapsed time of their responses 213 days 160 days 652 days without a response on something, 523 days, 294 days. In fact, we haven't had some responses, uh, and maybe they just submitted them actually, on um, Branson, 159 days, because when I looked in our database, it says open await response. We may have gotten something in the meantime. 
Um, but that's a long time. It is. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, one thing I wanted to raise, because we have investigated accidents in the past on uh, and recommended SMS going back years, uh, going back to um, 2010, where a passenger ferry made contact with the terminal at Staten Island. Legislation was uh, enacted authorizing action. Coast Guard didn't take action. We've it, we've issued other recommendations on SMS. Still no action. In um, Section 1135 of Title 49 of the U.S. Code, which is our um, our law, it says when the NTSB submits a recommendation about transportation safety to the Secretary of Transportation. I know D they, Coast Guard's under DHS, but it says Secretary of Transportation, the Secretary shall give to the board a formal written response to each recommendation not later than 90 days after receiving the recommendation. And then there's a process laid out. This requirement dates back to 1994, a law that was passed in 1994 when the U.S. Coast Guard was an agency within the U.S. Department of Transportation. After 9-11, the Coast Guard was, oh, I didn't start my timer. Um, the Coast Guard was then transferred to Homeland Security after 9-11. And is there a requirement now after that transfer for the Coast Guard or DHS to respond within 90 days of a safety recommendation? No, the only 90 day requirement uh, would be for the, the DOT agencies as I understand the rule. Right, so if anyone from Congress is listening, that is a hole right now where um, that needs uh, to be addressed. The conception's been in operation since 1980, 81, right? Yes. And uh, what inspections was the conception required to have? Uh, the conception was required to have um, annual inspections, uh, dry dock every two years, and a five-year uh, COI. And when was the last inspection for the conception? Uh, Mr. Ellers, uh, February of 2019. And Mr. Time. Ellers, there were really just sort of minor issues noted over the last five years, right? That's correct. Okay. And so with that, how about the vision? All of the vessels in the fleet had what we would consider fairly minor issues in all of their inspections. Okay, so do you think it's odd that one month after the accident, the Coast Guard would come back after the vision was inspected five months previous to the uh, fire and sinking, uh, where they really didn't find any major issues, they come back and they find 40 issues, deficiencies with the vision after, one month after, the fire and sinking of the conception. Uh, it, it might be considered unusual, but I will offer a couple of, of mitigating circumstances. One is the inspection that was conducted one month after was a targeted inspection as a result of the conception accident. And so they, the Coast Guard was looking, taking a very deep dive into each of these vessels of this type. The other thing is that the annual inspection that was conducted in February was when a vessel goes through a, a certificate of inspection inspection, the five-year inspection, it is supposed to be a deep dive. The annual re-inspection is supposed to be at a, a lesser uh, level unless the inspector finds something um, concerning and wants to dig deeper. So uh, while it is perhaps unusual, there are reasons why it, it may have been more during the targeted inspection. That could possibly suggest that they should go a little bit deeper on the other inspections, because if you're finding 40 five months after an annual inspection, that you may not be looking enough prior to that. Um, and in all that time, did does you know does do inspectors have? Could they note, hey, you know this this vessel. The emergency egress is in the same location as the stairwell. Could they have noted those things? Do they? Ha I know they have a chart and with a checklist. I've seen the checklist. 
It really doesn't ask that question, but could you have? Absolutely. In inspectors have the opportunity if they see any kind of safety concern to raise that concern. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's a tragedy. I think, you know, in, 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 the, in some of these situations, and I, this phrase is used a lot, tombstone mentality, when you don't take action until after the fact, and we have numerous um, uh, accidents or incidents where we've, we've asked the Coast Guard to take action or we've asked operators to take action. And unfortunately, uh, in the operator's case, it doesn't happen until after the fact. And in the Coast Guard, apparently, we need to ask five or six times. Uh, I do have additional questions, but i um, turning it back over to the chairman. Yeah, thank you. Um, do any of my colleagues have any um, any questions before I, I ask questions? I don't see any at this time, so I'm going to start my timer. Um, thank you, Member Hamadi. I want to go back to the issue of the Mr. Pantiocho, Mr. Joe P. Everybody else can pronounce it Pantiocho. Anyway, Joe P. Thank you. I want to go back to a few questions uh, about the the fire. So why do we believe that the fire did not originate in the Lazarette? What evidence do we, what evidence do we have for that? The crew members that were interviewed indicated that they looked into the Lazarette when they had reboarded the vessel after they swam to the stern and there was no fire in there. Additionally, if a fire had originated in the Lazarette, for it to transition to the to the salon, it would have to burn everything in between, which was not the case. Thank you. How about the engine room, which is uh, just forward of the Lazarette? Why do we believe that the fire did not originate in the engine room? I, I would offer pretty much the same answer, that the two crew members looked in there, and although they did see smoke, they didn't see any flames, they didn't sense any heat. And again, for it to transition to the salon, it would have to burn everything in between. Even if it transitioned through the horizontally um, below deck and into the bunk room, again, um, for it to pass through the bulkhead, it would have had to have heated it, charred it, and people would have noticed it, and the smoke detectors on the, in, on the bunk room side would have gone off. Thank you. And, um, and furthermore, the, um, the CO2 carbon uh, the CO2, the carbon dioxide uh, fire extinguisher system would have more than likely have, would have activated in the engine room, and there's no evidence of that from the witnesses, the crew members that looked in there. Is that correct? Correct. We we have sort of d differentiated the galley area from the salon, but in reality, it was all part of the same enclosed deck house. Why do we believe it did not originate actually in the galley portion of that deck house? Well, our understanding is that all of the galley equipment is de-energized at night. The crew members that were on the bow of the vessel trying to open the galley windows could not see any fire there. Of course, it was black with smoke, so they couldn't see into the salon. But the windows were not really hot to the touch. They were warm, but not hot. And so if a fire was in the galley, which is directly on the other side of those windows, it, they would have seen a fire and it would likely have been burning out of those windows already. And they saw the black smoke as they looked into the galley area as opposed to fire, which they did see in the aft part of, of the salon. Is that correct? Yes. Thanks. In the report, we noted that the uh, the vent rooms, the engine room vents were not closed by the crew. Did that in any way exacerbate the effects of the fire that we can tell? No, that, that wouldn't have because that would only have an impact on a fire in the engine room. Thank you very much. Um, I think my, probably my last question is this the owner of truth said that other than customer reviews he didn't he had no other way of evaluating the performance of the captain i do know and i think the vice chairman alluded to this 
And then in the railroad industry, they are doing, they have inward facing cameras in many locomotives. Uh, they have um, um, event data recorders. Well, let me, let me switch to aviation. In aviation, they are routinely downloading normal flights to look for exceedances. Has the marine industry looked at anything like this to be able to check the performance of, uh, of how things are going without physically being on the vessel? Mr. Chairman, uh, for small passenger vessels, we're not aware of any uh, any initiative like that. Well, that may be something worth worth considering um, down the road because <clears throat> you've got the, the the captain of a of a ship, just like the captain of an airliner, has a lot of autonomy. But with that autonomy, they have tremendous responsibility, and so we don't necessarily want to be spying on people. But as the owner of an organization that you do have the responsibility to make sure that when you hang out a shingle that you're providing a safe service, I think you've got an obligation to make sure that you are, in fact, conducting uh, things to the highest level of safety. So anyway, um, any other questions from any of my colleagues before we go back to Member Hamadi? Okay, Member Hamadi, you are now recognized for 10 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Terrell, I wanted to ask you a question um, before I go back to Mr. Tucker. Uh, how does the fire and sinking of the conception compare? in terms of significance and the number of fatalities to other marine accidents that we've investigated. Thank you, Member Hamidi. So going back to uh, 2000, I believe 2011, the, the Concordia accident in Italy uh, was about 32 fatalities, 32 lives were lost. In 2015, the El Faro sank and that was uh, 33 fatalities. And so now the conception is uh, probably the greatest loss of life in the U.S. Merchant Marine for many decades at 34. So you have the greatest loss of life in many decades. Clearly, we want to see what brought that about, what safety issues exist, how should those be addressed, because we'd never want that to ever happen again. Correct. We don't want the families to have to experience what these families are experiencing now, ever. And so my question is on the legal side, and I don't know if this is you or Mr. Tucker, you, you tell me, but um, earlier uh, somebody mentioned um, that we were unable, to, I believe, Mr. Tucker, we were unable to interview two of the crew. And those, uh, I be, uh, the two remaining crew, two of the remaining crew, who were the, who were, it was the captain and? One of the galley hands. One of the galley hands. And why was it important for us to interview the captain and what we, what would have we liked to ask? Adam? Yeah, member Hammond, the, uh, the captain of the Conception um, had been with the company for over three decades. Uh, he had operated the Conception for that duration of time and more. Um, so he had a, a, a very intricate knowledge of the vessel. Uh, he had knowledge of the operation of the vessel. He had no, uh, knowledge of every past inspection, Coast Guard inspection of the vessel, and just all the systems in general. Uh, so, unfortunately, we were not able to ask him these questions and learn from him um, his side of the story. And it's we were not able to ask him that, not because he refused. In fact, he showed up for the interview, wanted to be interviewed, and waited for a very substantial amount of time to be interviewed but what happened? 
Uh, Member Hamandi, uh, you're correct. He did wait. Uh, he showed up twice. And uh, we were unable to interview him uh, due to the parallel uh, criminal investigation. Right. And so in addition to that, uh, so those two, which would have been key for interviewing, we had several others we wanted to interview, but once, as you said earlier to the vice chairman, you know, once word gets out about a criminal investigation, people start getting a little bit concerned about talking. From between September 8th and September 10th, the assistant U.S. attorney served to search warrants on the offices of Truth Aquatics and their two remaining vessels. Were we able to get all the records and information we would have wanted from Truth Aquatics after that? Uh, Member Hammond, the, the records, yes. Uh, we were provided all the records in February of 2020, uh, February of uh, 2020. And um, there were other items that were uh, taken uh, as evidence uh, by the, uh, by the uh, Department of Justice. Uh, they were electronic devices, and they are still um, uh, in their possession. So we were unable to see uh, if there was any information uh, relevant to this accident uh, contained in any electronic devices. How many electronic devices are we talking about? Uh, Member Hammondy, there were, I'm estimating around 15. So 15 that we did not have access to that information. That is correct. How about wreckage access? Wreckage access. Um, so when the uh, when the wreckage was moved uh, to the uh, the naval base, uh, we did have uh, unrestricted uh, access to the wreckage. Uh, however, we were not able to uh, take the party uh, Truth Aquatics with us. They would have been important because the uh, the owner of the vessel knows that vessel. He he's seen the building of that vessel. He's uh, he can identify parts and materials that were um, uh, recovered at that time. How about structural components or loose items in the hull? That is correct. Uh, he would have been uh, integral in identifying those parts. Did, did we have access to those? We did have access to those, yes. Um, okay, and I read in one of the factual reports that some of this, the components were found in trash bags on the side. That is correct. Um, by the time we had returned uh, to the uh, the exam site, uh, a lot of the uh, material uh, was um, put in trash bags alongside. Uh, we were allowed access to uh, to to that material. Um, you know, all we had to do was remove it and that was it. Okay. And this isn't the first time where we've run into a situation and actually many times, whether it's Schoharie in New York, where we had uh, significant, significant issues with legal, uh, some, some uh, uh, legal actions that were taken at the same time or, cri or uh, criminal matters were moving at the same time of our safety investigation, but also duck. So I guess, Mr. Terrell, I mean, what's the answer for going forward? And I know you got you you got into this a, a bit with the vice chairman, but if you can talk about that a little bit more, I mean, there has to be a way where the FBI and the uh, the assistant attorney can pursue things on a uh, is can, can pursue criminal matters, but still allow us to do our safety investigation. Correct. Because, you know, once they're done prosecuting, we still have a safety issue. Correct. Uh, Member Hominy, yes, we, 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 have, we agree there's a, an issue here. And uh, like you said, it, it impacted the duck investigation as well. Uh, it started to, to rear its head, not just some marine investigations, but other modes. Uh, as safety investigators, we only ask to have unimpeded access to wreckage, witnesses, and documents immediately after an accident to be allowed to do our job in a, in a timely fashion. And by not having the documents contemporaneously with the interviews, it prevents our, you know, our investigators from asking relevant questions. Uh, this impacts not just the NTSB, but also the Coast Guard 
and other safety investigators we might be working with, especially in an international investigation. Uh, we do believe that we can work uh, in a parallel fashion. We have for many years. Uh, the FBI and the ATF were very helpful in this investigation. So we work routinely with many other agencies, and, and we want to continue doing that. We think the answer is working with the Department of Justice and perhaps working, uh, developing an MOU. Uh, but I do want to thank the Office of General Counsel for all their hard work in this case. Uh, it was a very complex investigation and was made more so with the delays we experienced. I think, uh, I think Kathleen has some comments to add. Kathy? Uh, Member Hobby, yes, we appreciate the question because it is a challenge. Um, and, and it's frequently a challenge in the early parts of an investigation. Uh, because again, remember our statute and our regs uh, appreciate that there are other agencies that have a role in, in accidents and investigative work. And um, our regulations actually direct us to, to cooperate and share information with others who have some other um, obligation as far as their own investigative work. But in those early days, it's very hard, particularly in a criminal case, to determine is this an intentional act or not, which sometimes is what um, precipitates the delays and the concerns. And we as an agency typically respect not wanting to interfere with that criminal work. Um, here, again, it took some more time. It took some more discussion and cooperation. And luckily, as with most of our modes, the investigative staff not only was collecting other information that was helpful, but they found other means to get to the safety information that to where they could bring these recommendations before the board today. But as um, Morgan was talking about, I think one of our goals is to keep working with the outside organizations to work with the Department of Justice. We need to keep informing what the board does, what our, what our roles are, what other roles are, so that we can make sure we continue to work well together. Thank you. And one, one last, one last um, quest, one last statement and question. We were able to get a lot of information, as you just said, uh, for this investigation. And I would just end with asking Mr. Tucker, part of that information came from the general public. We made several pleas during uh, different uh, press events asking for the public to send us information via our witness at ntsb.gov um, uh, email address, and that was successful. And I'll, I'll let you talk about that uh, for a second, and I'm, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, Member Hammondy, and uh, thank you for making that point. Um, the witness at ntsb.gov was very helpful to us, and I'd personally like to thank uh, everybody that had uh, submitted information uh, pictures, videos, historical information on the vessel. It was all uh, quite helpful and we do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Do any of my colleagues have any additional questions? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Bryson, if you would please read the proposed findings. Yes, sir. As a result of this investigation, staff proposes 18 findings. Number one, weather and sea conditions were not factors in the accident. Number two, the use of alcohol or other drugs by the conception deck crew likely was not a factor in the accident. Number three, the origin of the fire on the conception was likely inside the aft portion of the salon. Number four, although a definitive ignition source cannot be determined, the most likely ignition sources include the electrical, electrical distribution system of the vessel, unattended, unattended batteries being charged, improperly discarded smoking materials, or another undetermined ignition source. Number five, the exact timing of the ignition cannot be determined. <clears throat> Number six, most of the victims were awake, but could not escape the bunk room before all were overcome by smoke inhalation. Number seven, 
The fire in the salon on the main deck would have been well developed before the smoke activated the smoke detectors in the bunk room. Number eight, although the arrangement of detectors aboard the conception met regulatory requirements, the lack of smoke detectors in the salon delayed detection and allowed for the growth of the fire, precluded firefighting and evacuation efforts and directly led to the high number of fatalities in the accident. Number nine, interconnected smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces on subchapter T and subchapter K vessels would increase the chance that fires will be detected early enough to allow for successful firefighting and the evacuation of passengers and crew. Number 10, the absence of the required roving patrol on the conception delayed detection and allowed for the growth of the fire precluded firefighting and evacuation efforts and directly led to the high number of fatalities in the accident. Number 11, the U.S. Coast Guard does not have an effective means of verifying compliance with roving patrol requirements for small passenger vessels. Number 12, the conception bunk rooms emergency escape arrangements were inadequate because both means of escape led to the same space which was obstructed by a well-developed fire. Number 13, subchapter T, paren, old and new regulations are not adequate because they allow for primary and secondary means of escape to exit into the same space, which could result in those paths being blocked by a single hazard. Number 14, although designed in accordance with the applicable regulations, the effectiveness of the Conception's bunk room escape hatch as a means of escape was diminished by the location of bunks immediately under the hatch. Number 15, the emergency response by the Coast Guard and municipal responders to the accident was appropriate but was unable to prevent the loss of life given the rapid growth of the fire at the time of detection and location of the Conception. Number 16, Truth Aquatic safety oversight of its vessel's operations was inadequate. Number 17, had a safety management system been implemented, Truth Aquatics could have identified unsafe practices and fire risks on the conception and taken corrective action before the accident occurred. And number 18, implementing safety management systems on all domestic passenger vessels would further enhance operators' ability to achieve, to achieve a higher standard of safety. Ms. Bryson, thank you very much. At this time, uh, we'll do a roll call to ensure that all uh, all of the board members are prepared to deliberate. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Uh, present and uh, ready to deliberate, sir. Okay, Member Hamidi. I'm present, thank you, sir. You're welcome. I'm pinning you on. Okay. Member Graham. I am present and ready to deliberate. Thank you very much. And Member Chapman. Present, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, as far as amendments are concerned, I do understand that uh, we have at least two amendments. Uh, are there any other proposed amendments other than uh, what Member Hamidi is proposing? Okay, uh, if that's the case, uh, Member Hamidi, you are, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I have an amendment to finding number two. And my amendment would remove the word likely. Finding two currently reads the use of alcohol or other drugs by the conception deck crew which again was the captain, second captain, first deck hand, and second deck hand. It currently says likely was not a factor in the accident, and my amendment would remove the word likely. Okay, there's Member Hamidi's uh, motion to remove the word likely from finding number two. Is there a second? I'll second, sir, for friendly discussion. Okay, uh, it's been seconded by Vice Chairman Landsberg. Member Hamidi. Thank you. The NTSB has a stellar reputation for our accident investigations and for
for conducting fact-based investigations. And if in this situation, the four deck crew tested negative for drugs and alcohol, yet we have a finding that says the use of alcohol or other drugs by the deck crew was likely not a factor in this accident. I think that if the standard is now going forward that anybody could could have alcohol or drugs in their system that was part of an accident that we investigate uh, outside of DOT or DHS regulations, then we the standard would have to be likely every single time. Because the argument is, or was stated, that they could have been, they could have had Benadryl, they could have had something else they weren't tested for, not required under testing requirements. That would be the standard for everyone. So we would always say likely, and in this situation, they did not test positive, they tested negative. So I think it is a slippery slope our accident investigations are fact-based. The fact is these four crew members tested negative for alcohol and drugs. That's what should be reflected in the report. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, discussion amongst my crew members, amongst my colleagues. Well, um, I'll, I'll jump in there, and uh, we certainly will want to hear from staff as well. I do agree, Member Homendy, that we do want to conduct stellar investigations and that they need to be fact-based. And I think that unless we can absolutely rule something out, then, then the word likely is appropriate. It's kind of ironic because later in this board meeting, I'm going to argue to add the word likely uh, because I, I, I'm not convinced that we can absolutely say what, we're, what we are saying. Uh, I think the report itself, the main body of the report, clearly states that those crew members did not test for certain certain drugs. I, I do hear, and I, we do want to hear from Dr. McKay, I do hear what my, what Dr. McKay is saying. Dipenhydrine is not something that is tested for, and yet it is a, a sleep aid and also a widely used over-the-counter uh, cold medication. So, um, I, I, at this point, I believe the word likely is appropriate. Um, other comments? I'd like to respond. Well, absolutely. Uh, I think you can, I think we cannot be in, we should not be in the position of, unless we can rule it out, it should be likely. There's no evidence suggesting otherwise, zero evidence. And I think creating uncertainty when we've clearly stated in the body of the report that they've tested negative and yet in the findings we're creating uncertainty by using the word likely is not right okay um member chapman did you want to say something it, it, yes I, I i think member homedy makes a good point uh, and particularly going forward i i don't know how we i mean it seems to me that the finding, similar findings going forward will have to be conditional. And um, I, I don't think that's helpful. Um, and I wonder if maybe the way to s solve this is, is not to arm wrestle over whether likely should or shouldn't be in the finding, but make the finding more precise. Um, make the finding speak to what we do know, which is that they didn't test positive or they were or they tested negative um, for the drugs for which they were tested. Um, because I, we can never, uh, so far as I know, we can never completely eliminate the possibility that there may have been drugs involved. But we do know that they were tested for certain drugs and they, they tested negative for those drugs. Why couldn't we reword the statement so that it re refers to what they were tested for? Well, there's a motion on the table, and so if we, you know, if we want to get into rewording it, then we'll have to uh, do something with this motion. Um, so, any other comments from from my colleagues before we turn to the staff, Vice Chairman Landsberg? I think I uh, tend to agree with uh, Member Chapman in that uh, 
Um, otherwise, we're, we're always out there looking at virtually everything that could possibly, and yet we have no data whatsoever to say. So uh, I think I would, as, as it is stated, um, maybe that's not the best way, but I think if we uh, said that they were tested for specific areas, then that, that, res that cuts the baby in half, so to speak, and solves, solves the problem uh, in terms of being specific. And going forward, I think if we have any indications or we have any concerns that somebody uh, who is in a safety critical position uh, has somehow been impaired by an over-the-counter drug, then maybe we ought to be testing for that. And then we could make the positive statement. If, if I could add, in the past, we've said likely when somebody tested positive for marijuana, but has said, but we've said that could have been in their system for the past 30 days, 45 days, whatever it is. In this situation, we have no evidence to suggest that. Okay, thank you. Member Graham. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I don't like likely in this case. Uh, the standard was set. They, they tested negative. Um, and now we're talking about four crew members. So uh, we're saying that it could have been any one of them. And, and then even in the interviews, uh, they were very explicit about drugs and alcohol were not allowed. And it, it seemed like the crew members really lived lived up to that part of of the guidelines that were given out by the company, although the others weren't. So I, I, I'm not a fan of likely. I, I don't like that either. I kind of like likely, but uh, but I want to I want to go to uh, uh, the staff. And uh, why don't we start out with uh, with Dr. McKay? Actually, uh, Chairman, uh, this, this is uh, Morgan just jumping in here. Yeah. I have sort of run this by uh, the doctor, and we would we understand uh, Member Hominy's concern, and we Member Chapman, we, we were listening to you as well as maybe there's a middle ground, and we were proposing counter proposing maybe that we strike the word likely, and insert the words uh, the use of alcohol or other quote tested for unquote drugs by the conception crew, so that sort of eliminates the. Uh, you know, the uh, likely word and actually makes it a little more precise. I'd like for you to um, to specifically read that because we've got a motion on the table. And uh, and so let's let let's see what you are proposing to 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 say into that, if you would, please. Yes, sir. So finding number two, the use of alcohol. Or other. Quote, tested hyphen or an end quote drugs by the conception deck crew was not a factor in the accident well that really kind of waters it down i mean that uh, the point that dr mckay was making is that um, that you know there could have been some some other drug other than a 15 panel that could have caused drowsiness i mean i I will, well, I'll uh, let uh, Dr. Mary Pat talk, to, talk about herself there. So go ahead, doctor. Sorry, so this is language that we have used at the board in the past. It's very specific. The report, actually, I, I believe the report has a footnote that lists the drugs that were tested for. Um, and um, I will say that the the I know Morgan was responding to a text I sent, but that quotation marks don't need to be in there. So it would simply be that um, alcohol or other tested for drugs, and then the likely would be removed. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> All right, okay, so, so let me just read that and then I'll go back to my colleagues here. So what, what staff apparently is proposing is the use of alcohol or other tested for drugs by the conception deck crew was not a factor in the accident. Is that basically what staff was was recommending or suggesting? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Member Hamandy, if, if we were to withdraw your motion or accept a friendly amendment, would you be willing to go for that? 
Uh, I would withdraw my amendment and uh, uh, go for that change, yeah. Okay, thank you. Member Homendy has agreed to withdraw her motion. Um, Vice Chairman, since you seconded it, would you be willing to go along with that as well? I absolutely would, sir. Thank you very much. Member Homendy, you're recognized. Uh, then I will uh, withdraw my motion on finding two and offer the following amendment uh, to finding two, which reads the use of, which would read the use of alcohol or other tested for drugs by the conception deck crew was not a factor in the accident. Okay, that's her motion. Uh, is there a second? Second. Vice Chairman seconds. Any further discussion? Okay, we'll proceed with a uh, with a roll call vote uh, for to to amend finding number two as read, and uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. I think I said that. Uh, those in favor of the motion will will state aye. Those opposed will state no. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. And the chairman votes aye. So we have unanimously adopted finding number two. Uh, okay, Member Hamidi, I believe you have an amendment for uh, for another finding as well. Yes, I have an amendment, and thank you to Dr. McKay and Mr. Terrell and to my crew. Did you call us crew members, Mr. Chairman? To my fellow crew members for making that. Sorry, it's work. Like airline pilot in me. Sorry about that. Uh, understood. I liked it. Uh, I have an amendment to finding number 16. Finding number 16 currently states Truth Aquatic safety oversight of its vessel's operations was inadequate. My amendment would replace that to read Truth Aquatics provided limited safety oversight of its vessel's operations, which jeopardized the safety of crew members and passengers. Okay, there's Member, uh, member Homedy's motion. Is there a second? Second. Member Graham seconds. A discussion. Member Homedy, please. Thank you. Uh, I. In reading 16, and I understand what uh, the staff was, was going for there, I just really thought after I read through the docket and the excellent materials that the investigative staff put together, that inadequate was not strong enough of a word to what really was going on. They really did, staff didn't feel that we could say there was no oversight because we weren't able to uh, uh, talk with the captain and one of the other crew members, but that there was limited oversight. And so that's why it says limited. And then it clearly their uh, inadequacies jeopardize the safety of crew members and the passengers, which is why I added that because I thought it needed to be stronger. Thank you very much. Um, Discussion from my colleagues. Mr. Chairman. Please. I, I like the amendment. I do want to make one suggestion, though, because I think both in the original finding as proposed <clears throat> and in the amendment uh, that Member Hamandi offers, there is an inconsistency with the wording in the probable cause. And I know we may we may end up discussing some changes to the probable cause as well, but I don't think this would... <clears throat> I don't think this would impact that. The probable cause speaks in terms of effective or ineffective oversight. Um, the original finding talks about um, inadequate oversight, and the um, the amendment talks about limited oversight. I think we should uh, stick with the terminology that's in the probable cause, which is effective or ineffective. I, I totally agree. I had uh, flagged that as well, because you're right in the proposed probable cause that Member Hamidi will offer. We do refer to effective, lack of effective oversight. So so or is what you're proposing is is uh, for a friendly amendment, I think, 
to to cause number 16 to state truth aquatics truth aquatics provided ineffective safety oversight of its vessels operations which jeopardize the safety of crew members and passengers is that is that what you were thinking m member chapman yes that's correct that's what i would suggest is to replace limited with ineffective i, I do agree with that um and, but it's not up to me so um uh, I do want to hear from all of our all of the colleagues, but Member Hamadi, what would be your thoughts to that a friendly amendment to strike the word limited, replace with ineffective? I'm okay with replacing that word. Yeah, further discussion with my colleagues. Yes, sir, Member I, Brown. I, I would definitely support that, and I think it would be consistent uh, with the rest of the report like uh, Member Chapman has pointed out. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Landsberg, any, any thoughts from you? I agree. Thank you. And uh, we'll turn to the staff now. And uh, Mr. Terrell, what says the staff? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we concur with the, with the amendment, uh, the friendly amendment by Member Chapman and the original uh, insertion of the words uh, which jeopardize the safety of crew members and passengers. So the, uh, the staff has no objection. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion with my with the colleagues? Um, Member Hamadi, would you kindly restate the motion? So, and then we'll take a take a vote on it. The, the motion's been. Uh, go ahead. Uh, it would read. Finding sixteen would read Truth Aquatics. Ineffective safety oversight. Oh no. That doesn't work, actually. Yeah, provided. Truth Aquatics provided. Provided ineffective safety oversight of its vessel's operations, which jeopardize the safety of crew members and passengers. And uh, that would be your motion, I believe. Correct. Yes. Uh, and it's been seconded. Um, so any further discussion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded to adopt to amend finding 16 to read as member Hamadi read it. We'll proceed to a roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamadi. Aye. Member Hamadi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. Uh, finding 16 has been amended as proposed by member Harmony. Any other amendments to the uh, to the findings? Okay, do I have a motion to adopt the findings as amended? So moved. Vice Chairman has moved. Second. It's been seconded. We have a motion to adopt the findings as amended. It's been seconded. Is there any further discussion on this? Okay, roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. The findings have been adopted as amended. Ms. Bryson, if you'll please read the proposed probable cause. Yes, sir. Staff proposes the following probable cause. The National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident on board the small passenger vessel Conception was the ineffective oversight of Truth Aquatics, Inc., which did not ensure that a required roving patrol was maintained, allowing a fire of unknown cause to grow undetected in the vicinity of the aft salon on the main deck. Contributing to the undetected growth of the fire was the lack of a regulatory requirement for smoke detection in all accommodation spaces. Contributing to the high loss of life were the inadequate emergency escape arrangements from the vessel's bunk room as both exited into a compartment that was engulfed in fire, therefore pre preventing escape. Ms. Bryson, thank you very much. I believe we have... Uh um, uh, one problem, one uh, proposed amendment to the probable cause. I will likely 
withdraw my proposed amendment. But uh, Mr. Graham, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, did did the uh, managing director mean to say thereby preventing escape instead of therefore in the probable cause at the last the last sentence? I did. It is written thereby preventing escape. Yeah. I thought I heard therefore. I may have. Thank you for catching that. Yeah, I just want to. Yeah, thank you very much for catching that. Okay, um, thank you. Is there a, um, so just so I can get an idea, uh, I know that Member Hamidi, I believe you're proposing a an amendment to the probable cause. Any other potential amendments? Okay, again, I will likely with not even offer mine because I think hers is going to be better and will take care of the concern I had. So Member Hamidi, you are recognized. Thank you very much. I have an amendment uh, to the probable cause so that the probable cause would read, the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident on board the small passenger vessel Conception was the failure of Truth Aquatics Inc. to provide effective oversight of vessel and crew member operations including requirements to ensure that a roving patrol was maintained, which allowed a fire of unknown cause to grow undetected in the vicinity of the aft salon on the main deck. Contributing to the undetected growth of the fire was the lack of a United States Coast Guard require, regulatory requirement for smoke detection in all accommodation spaces, Contributing to the high loss of life were the inadequate emergency escape arrangements from the vessel's bunk room as both exited into a compartment that was engulfed in fire, thereby preventing escape. Thank you. And uh, I think you probably said it. That That is your motion. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make sure that was officially a, a motion. Uh, is there a second? I'll, I'll second, say. Mr. Chairman. Okay, uh, Member Chapman seconds it. Discussion. Uh, thank you very much. The um, original probable cause did discuss ineffective oversight of Truth Aquatics, although there was going to be a change to that. I think my concern was that it wasn't strong enough. At the end of the day, there's one person in charge of safety, and that was the owner of these vessels and the owner of the company, and that was Truth Aquatics. It is clear to me, based on the interviews and the, do the documentation that the investigative staff gathered, that tr the owner of Truth Aquatics had no idea what was going on on his vessels and that he turned it, it was a complete turnover of all safety oversight to the captains of those vessels. And while that may be how the industry operates, it's not right. He's responsible for safety. And I think it should be made very clear that that was a failure. In addition, I wanted to be very clear whose regulatory requirement that is for smoke detection and that is the United States Coast Guard. Yeah, thank you very much. Comments, questions from the board members? Mr. Chairman, I believe the amendment improves the, strengthens the probable cause and I support it. Thank you. Member Graham. I would support it also because uh, like another Marine accident we had earlier this year that went to board meeting that lacked uh, operational control from the top that no doubt this did too so i think it's it's time we let the industry know that it's uh we need to they all need to get on board with this um so i would support the amendment thank you vice chairman any any thoughts from you sir i have nothing to add other than uh than i agree and uh, also uh in our discussions we talked about how long it took for uh coast guard to respond to some of the recommendations um, I, I would hope that uh, that's not lost on them. Thank you. Member Hamadi, um, I'm, I'm going to ask that you consider one adding one word, and it's the word it's. And so 
it would read, I'll just say, the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident on board the small passenger vessel Conception was the failure of Truth Aquatics, Inc.'s, Inc., to provide effective oversight over its over its vessel and crew member operations. Uh, oversight over or oversight of it? I'm sorry, whatever. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, oversight of, just as the way you wrote it, oversight okay. of its vessels and crew member operations. I think that that is a good change. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, and thank you for what I believe all of us will support is a much in, nothing against what staff has proposed, but it, uh, but I think it is stronger. And uh, Member Graham, I think you you seconded uh, her motion, so we're we're just proposing as a friendly amendment to just uh, I'm sorry, as Member Chapman, okay. but uh, to add in the word "its." So we're saying that effective effective oversight over excuse me, effective oversight of its vessels and crew member operations. Yes, that's a good change, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Um, any, before I turn to staff, any further discussion amongst the board members? And just to clarify, it's vessel and crew member operations. So vessel yeah. operation, not just the, not just the vessels itself. I just. Yeah, thank okay. you. I'm, I may not have read that properly. So, uh, so uh, shall I just read that first sentence again? Does, does everybody understand it? Because I sure could you could you read it again? Yeah, I think I will because just to make sure that we since we've pen and inked in something. So uh, Member Hamidi's uh, amended motion or uh, motion with a friendly amendment would be the National Transportation Safety Board determines that the probable cause of the accident on board the small passenger vessel Conception was the failure of Truth Aquatics, Inc. to provide effective oversight of its vessel and crew member operations, including requirements to ensure that a roving patrol was maintained. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, nothing else is, it would be just exactly the way that Member Hamandy read it. So I... I just want to make sure we all knew where that it's was being added in there. Um, staff, what, what would be your thoughts on this proposed amendment that Member Hamidi has proposed? Uh, thank you, Chairman and Board Members. I appreciate that. We, we generally don't object to the proposed improvements in the first sentence. Uh, for the second sentence, the office uh, had we prefer to keep the original draft language. It's true that the uh, single point of failure existed for a long time and staff's proposed a recommendation to the Coast Guard for installed fire detection on small passenger vessels, but we're not, we're not, this is not a big issue for us, but just our preference. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have seen in the past probable cause statements where we have disembodied the organization that was involved. And, and, and I believe, I may have seen a draft probable cause at one time in my life that did not include the, the very organization that had the accident. And, and I, don't, I don't agree with that. I think when we're naming in a probable cause, if it's company XYZ, we need to name company XYZ. We're not trying to hide anything. We need to call it that way. And likewise, who was the regulatory authority that did not, excuse me, that um, th that di did not um, have a regulatory requ requirement for smoke detection in all accommodation spaces? Who was the regulatory authority? Was it the FAA? Was it the DOT? Who was it? It was the U.S. Coast Guard that didn't have that re that 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 requirement, mm. and and so I, I support it, and I respect the viewpoint of staff. But I do believe that when we're talking about naming organizations in a probable cause statement, we shouldn't hide who we're trying to say. Yes, Jim, we 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 understand. Thank you. Th thank you very much. And I want to say, too, that we have had 
and this is not about being best buddies with anybody, but we we do have a good working relationship with the Coast Guard. Uh, I, 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 I mean that sincerely. Again, I had a conversation with the Commandant yesterday. Morgan, you were on the call, and I know that they are committed to doing whatever they can within the legal framework to improve safety. And we appreciate the work that the Coast Guard has done with us uh, over the years. And, um, and I will specifically call out Captain Neubauer so, uh, because he's always helped us so much. That said, any other discussion regarding the uh, proposed amendment by Member Homedy? Okay, seeing none, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the probable cause as amended by Member Homedy and we will be voting to approve the entire probable cause, not just a section of it, but the entire probable cause as read by Member Homedy. Okay, any questions about what we're voting on? Okay, uh, Vice Chairman Landsberg, what say you, sir? Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. The probable cause has been adopted as amended. Uh, Ms. Bryson, if you'd please read the proposed recommendations. Yes, sir. As a result of its investigation, the National Transportation Safety Board makes the following 10 new safety recommendations. And in addition, we're making a, a recommendation to reiterate one previous recommendation. There are seven new recommendations to the U.S. Coast Guard. Number one, revise the revised Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations, subchapter T, to require that newly constructed vessels with overnight accommodations have smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces. Number two, revise Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations, subchapter T, to require that all vessels with overnight accommodations currently in service including those constructed prior to 1996, have smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces. Number three, revise Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations, subchapter T and subchapter K, to require all vessels with overnight accommodations, including vessels constructed prior to 1996, have interconnected smoke detectors such that when one de detector alarms, the remaining detectors also alarm. Number four, develop and implement an inspection procedure to verify that small passenger vessel owners, operators, and charterers are conducting roving patrols as required by Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Subchapter T. Number five, Revised Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Subchapter T, to require newly constructed small passenger vessels with overnight accommodations to provide a secondary means of escape into a different space than the primary exit so that a single fire should not affect both escape paths. Number six, Revised Title 46, Code of Federal Regulations, Subchapter T, to require all small passenger vessels with overnight accommodations, including those constructed prior to 1996, to provide a secondary means of escape into a different space than the primary exit so that a single fire should not affect both escape paths. Number seven, review the suitability of Title 46 Code of Federal Regulations, Subchapter T, regulations regarding means of escape to ensure there are no obstructions to egress on small passenger vessels constructed prior to 1996 and modify regulations accordingly. In addition, there are two recommendations to the Passenger Vessel Association, Sport Fishing Association of California, and National Association of Charter Boat Opera Operators. The first of those, which is recommendation number eight, until the U.S. Coast Guard requires all passenger vessels with overnight accommodations, including vessels constructed prior to 1996, to have smoke detectors in all accommodation spaces, share the circumstances of the conception accident with your members 
and encourage your members to voluntarily install interconnected smoke and fire detectors in all accommodation spaces such that when one detector alarms, the remaining detectors also alarm. The second recommendation to that group, which is recommendation number nine, until the US Coast Guard requires small passenger vessels with overnight accommodations to provide a secondary means of escape into a different space than the primary exit, share the circumstances of the conception accident with your members and encourage your members to voluntarily do so. In addition, there is one recommendation to Troop Aquatics, which is the 10th new recommendation and that is to implement a safety management system for your fleet to improve safety practices and minimize risk. As I mentioned, there is one uh, recommendation to be reiterated in this report, and that recommendation is M12-3, which states, as a result of its investigation of this accident, the National Transportation Safety Board reiterates safety recommendation M12-3, which is currently classified as open unacceptable response. Um, and that is to the United States Coast Guard, sorry, to the United States Coast Guard require all operators of US flag passenger vessels to implement SMS, taking into account the characteristics, methods of operation and nature of service of these vessels and with respect to ferries, the sizes of the ferry systems within which the vessels operate. And that again is M12-3. And this concludes this recommendations. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations as read? So I move. Okay, um, Vice Chairman has moved. Second. And, uh, Member Graham has seconded. Any discussion regarding the recommendations? Seeing none, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the recommendations as proposed. There's no discussion, no further discussion. Roll call vote, Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye, Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye, Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye, Member, votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The chairman votes aye. The recommendations have been adopted as proposed. As far as the adoption of the final report, um, I do have one motion for the final report. Um, and I'm going to make a motion right now. This is what I circulated at about six o'clock last night. Um, in, in writing, if you have it. My motion is to, on page 101, line 11, I'm going to take that likely that we struck earlier and propose that we add it here. So on what, page 101, line 11, insert the word likely, and the sentence would now read, if the company had been actively engaged in ensuring the safe practices required by regulations, were being followed, most notably the requirement for a roving patrol, the fire would likely have been discovered earlier and the consequences of this onboard fire would have been greatly diminished. So that is my motion. Is there a second? Second. Yeah, Member Hamidi is seconded. And uh, this, this bugged me all weekend long. Uh, so, if in fact, if this was a, let's just say that we, we, we've kind of, we, you know, we've kind of said it could be an electrical fire, it could be a uh, lithium battery fire, it could be a, um, uh, uh, discarding uh, smoking materials, or it could be something else. Um, I'm very suspicious of the lithium batteries, given their history. And they can explode and they can ignite very quickly. And given that the lithium batteries were toward the aft part of the salon, a rapid fire there could have blocked both the escape hatch, which was in the aft por portion of the salon, and of course, the, 
the circular stairway, which was in the up front close to the galley. So, you know, the roving watch person could have been in the engine room or something looking at something, and this thing would have ostensibly could have exploded, and there may not have been anything that could have reduced the consequences. So I would just feel better saying that the fire would likely have been discovered earlier, and that's my motion. Discussion. I like it. <laughs> Likely it. Okay, thanks. Any other discussion before we turn to staff? Uh, I, w I would just add that I think it's a it's a good change. It's, I agree with your comments about lithium batteries, uh, as I've worked on those issues for a number of years, and something could happen very quickly, and it may not be discovered until too late in another situation, even with a roving patrol. So thank you for that change. Well, thank you. Uh, Member Graham. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said earlier, I'm not always a fan of a likely, but I think in this case, uh, I was afraid it was going to diminish what, what we're trying to get across here. I have no doubt if they were effectively doing a roving patrol that it would have diminished, diminished the outcome of this uh, tragedy. But like you said, in the scenario you, you just uh, gave us an example of, I think in this case likely would be appropriate, so I would support it. Well, thank you very much. I mean, and certainly I don't expect people to vote on something just because I, I offer it as an amendment, but uh, uh, it bothered me, it bothered me, it bothered me. I'm going to let it go. And then finally, last night, as you know, at six o'clock, I came and typed up something and emailed to everyone. Um, Member Chapman, any thoughts on your part, sir? You, you know, I was leaning against it, Mr. Chairman, but you made a good argument, and, it, and Member Graham just uh, alluded to it. Your your point about the fact that even had they been aware of this, the the severity of of lithium battery fires can sometimes be uh, really significant, and because of the location of where the charging was going on, uh, had a fire ignited and spread quickly even if they had been Johnny on the spot, I'm not sure it would have made a difference because it would have blocked the escape route. Uh, it could, could have, and thank you. By the way, the board will release in the next 30 days or so a, a report on how emergency responders deal with electric vehicle fires. And just today in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article about the same thing, that when first responders go to these electric vehicles, which are, are becoming widely used, uh, they do pose a hazard for first responders. So the lithium batteries can be wonderful. They provide a lot of energy source, but they have a potential downside as well. Uh, staff, any thoughts on the uh, amendment offered by me? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in here. My my great writer, Kristen, she did a terrific job in this report, and we've been looking at your change. Uh, we would like to propose that the wording would be, the fire likely would have been discovered. Yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm certainly fine with that. And um, so it, it would just say the fire, instead of we're just moving the word likely, we're moving it, the fire likely would have would. Been discovered. Yep. Yes, I don't have a problem with that. Um, I'll accept that if my well, that that's my I accept the friendly amendment. So it'd say the fire likely would have been discovered earlier. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Remember how many uh, you uh, you seconded it. So could you could you go along with that? Yep. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I do want to point out this was Kristen's uh, first report and she's done a, a great job of it. Uh, so thank you very much. So there's a motion on the table. Um, it's been moved and seconded to adopt the motion as proposed by, by me. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, roll call vote. Vice Chairman Landsberg, uh, do, you, do you adopt the, uh, do you vote for the uh, amendment? Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Homedy. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Homedy votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. Uh, the Chairman votes aye. The amendment for 
the, mo the amendment offered by chairman has been adopted unanimously. And now, uh, does anyone have any any issues or discussion related to the report that they would like to talk about right now? Seeing none, um, is there a motion to adopt the report as revised? I so move. Second. Uh, Member Hamidi votes aye. Vice Chair, oh, excuse me, uh, Vice Member Hamidi, uh, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Member Hamidi. I'm going to vote aye, but I'm not there <laughs> <Okay>. yet. <laughs> Member Hamidi moves uh, to adopt the report as revised. Vice Chairman Landsberg seconds. Uh, is there any discussion regarding that motion? Okay, thanks. We'll now vote to to adopt the final report as amended. Vice Chairman Landsberg. Vice Chairman votes aye. Vice Chairman votes aye. Member Hamidi. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Hamidi votes aye. Member Graham. Member Graham votes aye. Member Graham votes aye. Member Chapman. Member Chapman votes aye. Member Chapman votes aye. The Chairman votes aye. The report has been adopted as revised. Uh, do any members wish the right to file a concurring or dissenting statement? I'd like to reserve the right, sir. Okay, member Hamidi does. Okay, seeing no more. As we prepare to wrap up the board meeting, I invite those participating in the meeting to turn off their cameras and microphones. In closing, I want to thank my colleagues on the board for preparing for their preparation going into the board meeting. I thought about saying this at the very beginning. I was very impressed with the comments that you wrote memos on to staff as I reread the report. I saw that the report was a better product, not that the report writers didn't do a great job, but I do think that the 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 the, the my colleagues on the board uh, have taken a good report and made it uh, even better. So thank you for doing that. I'd also like to uh, thank you, my colleagues, for the good uh, discussion and debate. I think this is, uh, uh, we don't always have to agree. Here's a case where we did, but I think that we get a better product through these debates uh, and, and discussions. So thank you for that. Member Hamidi, thank you and your team for your work as board member on scene. Special thanks go to the investigator in charge, Adam Tucker, and for our Office of uh, Marine Safety, who led a successful investigation under very challenging conditions. But Joe P. works in, um, is our fire expert who works in research and engineering. So really nothing around here gets done by just one person or one one staff, one department. It, it is an agency-wide um, effort that gets these things done. And that includes the program and the support staff. It also includes those behind the scenes that work to pull off a technical production to allow a board meeting with people all over the country. So thank you to everyone. The recommendations that we've issued today, if implemented, and that's the key, if implemented, would reduce the risk of future passenger vessel fires growing undetected, and it would ensure that escape routes exit to different spaces, improving the chances for survival for passengers and crew. We recommend that Truth Aquatics implement safety management system, and we re reiterated our recommendation for the U.S. Coast Guard to require SMS for all passenger vessels, an action that's long overdue. The Congress mandated that 10 years ago the NTSB recommended it eight years ago. It's past time to act. Thank you. We stand adjourned.